our way in just moments. Today, we are going to test it for circulation in the legs. It's called peripheral disease. We're going to get underway in just a few moments. So stay tuned, stay with us. The benefit, one of the benefits of joining this live stream is you actually get to see the behind the scenes. We are going to be streaming live to 860 AM, The Answer. Uh, it's a radio station in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And we also um, simulcast online, as you can see through YouTube. But you get to see all the behind the scenes. We have, you know, uh, Colin, who is producing for the radio station. And we have Josh, who's producing our YouTube stream here. So uh, make sure that you do put any sort of questions or Thoughts that you might have in the comment section. And we're going to get underway in just a few moments. We have quite a few people that are joining the Zoom feed as well. Um, quite a few. Wow, we have a lot of folks. Uh, and Dr. John Phillips and I will get underway hosting this in a moment. We are joined by John Romans. He is the CEO of Biomedics. It is a company that makes a pad testing device called PadNet. And we're going to talk about that in a moment, as well as a new study that came out talking about how younger and younger people are getting diagnosed with PAD and its advanced stage known as critical limb ischemia. So we'll get into all of that in just a moment. So stay tuned. Nailed it. You sound really crisp today, Kim, like you are on the ball. I love it. I know. I think it's because my hair is more crisp today. Got it cut. <laughs> Got a new hair device. <laughs> Mine is very much the latter. I've been it's 50 degrees out, and I was at a soccer. My first soccer game was at 8 a.m. and it was freezing. Oh, I had a hat on. <clears throat> You're still wearing a hat, doctor. Oh, a knit a knit hat, like a it's so cold hat. <clears throat> a winter one. Oh, you had one hat. of the beanie hats. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. One of those, one of these days, we'll have to do live from the soccer game with you on camera with your beanie hat on. As long as he has some mittens that have the fingertips cut off, that's mittens. All. There's actually this device. Straight. It's it's like a, a cape called the Mombi that you kind of put over. It's got a hood and you. It, it's a cape basically, but it's insulated and um, weather. Resistant, basically, water, rain, etc. Well, and wait, it me, look at it. It took me a while to to stomach the the fact that I need to get one of these, and I got one, and it's the best investment I've had on these soccer fields and now lacrosse fields, I guess. <clears throat> I love watching lacrosse. Lacrosse is really fun. My I know nothing just... about it. Nothing. <laughs> it's really, it, it's a good game. I mean, it's a, amazing how those guys, the coordination that they have to keep the ball in the little net and, and be able to throw so accurately and catch it. I mean, it's a little net. I know. And they catch. I mean, it's a little ball, but I mean that. And they, it, it, they literally fling it. And the eye-hand coordination blows my mind. Really talented group of people. My brother was a was a goalie. Yeah. That's tough because that, that they whipped that ball in there. and. <clears throat> mm -hmm. In fact, oh, yeah. the highest incidence of commotio cordis, which is what happened to, what was his name? The Bills football player on Monday Night Football yeah. Yeah. Um, occurs in lacrosse. And so there, the oh, chest wow. protectors that they have have a special little thing on it for it. <laughs> I mean, it's very rare, but it is, I mean, they whip that ball in there. But I don't understand yeah. the rules. Uh, and that it, I have to learn the rules because it frustrates me because I'm like, I don't know what I'm watching. That's funny. But it's um, all good. My brother, mm -hmm. if you ever need a little, he'll completely give you the load. Um, but the goalie, the goal is very small compared to goals I'm used to, the, you know, soccer, et cetera. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a smaller ball. But then they, 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 evidently the field of play is past the goal too you know they go around it which in soccer football you know that's not acceptable but it's always good to learn something new <clears throat> yep it is so um we'll have to kind of say we're gonna get this padtest.org working 
I assume for some reason, I think, I think, um, John, I think your team is still getting some of the, the folks up on the, on the um, thing. So it's not quite working yet, but at least there's a placeholder there. Oh no, it's working now. They must've gotten it up. Adara might've got jumped in there. Um, we actually I don't, we probably can't know nope, you can't see it. If you go to padtest.org, um, yeah. that is the site we're going to be, um, promoting. All right, it's everybody really heads up, seven up, 10 seconds till we're live. Okay. Um, John's team has been working tirelessly, Adara and This is 8.60 um, a.m. The uh, answer. It's pretty awesome. Sponsored by The Way to My Heart Incorporated. Welcome to the heart of innovation. 60 minutes that can save life and limb. With new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org in partnership with Abbott. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Well, don't ever tell a patient ever again that they're too young to have poor circulation in their legs, known as peripheral artery disease along with an increase in adolescent diabetes to type 2 diabetes, according to the CDC, doctors telling patients they are too young is likely a big culprit in what has led to a higher number of advanced stage poor circulation, or PAD, known as critical limb ischemia, or CLI patients, in people ages 18 to 40. It used to be an old person's disease. Well, you know what? Not anymore. A new study in Science Direct just out on April 14th shows a disturbing trend in a younger demographic of CLI patients under age 40. Even more, this new Science Direct study found a higher number of amputations with higher rates of surgical procedures, such as bypasses, and fewer minimally invasive approaches in hospitals. Very strange, because if you think about diabetic patients, which we think these patients might be, especially type two, they typically get more disease below the knee, which often requires wires and balloons in a minimally invasive method to get clear into the small vessels in the foot. So throughout the show today, we're going to get a little more into that study, and that's going to lead us into a conversation about democratizing access to testing for PAD. We have John Romans, CEO of a pad testing device company called Biomedics. Their device is called PadNet. He's going to be talking about that and a partnership with my organization, the Global PAD Association, that's going to democratize access to testing. So really exciting uh, show planned. John, before we get started, how is everything going this week? You've already had a busy morning. I mean, you're not only seeing <laughs> piggies during the week but you're you know out there on the soccer field on the lacrosse field on saturday mornings helping to keep those collaterals growing in your kids <laughs> yeah good afternoon kim how are you i'm doing um you know we're doing well we had a busy week it was interesting because last week you did the show and i was on quote on location with phillips doing that educational event and yeah. we did briefly touch on what uh, you were referring to in the in the Journal of Cardiovascular Revascularization Medicine about um, trends in limb loss uh, in and critical limb ischemia in, in young adults in the United States. So certainly this should be an interesting conversation. Those educational events that we participate in are fantastic because it just it it goes to show that this disease is is very prevalent and there are physicians out there that want to learn more about it and become better interventionalists and surgeons and 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 treat patients uh, yeah. the um the best they can <clears throat> but yeah today was busy we were out on the soccer itch as they call it and you know just hopefully the weather gets a little warmer it's a little chilly here in columbus <laughs> it's nice out here in california today but yet i haven't gotten out to enjoy it because i've also been sitting here and you were mentioning those um, you know, continuing education events um, that doctors attend. And there's one actually on right now, virtually um, put on by Pegasus, Dr. Robert Beasley out of Florida, Dr. Miguel Montero Baker, a vascular surgeon out of Texas. I also saw um, Dr. Jay Matthews out of Florida and even Dr. Peter Sukas out of Rhode Island. 
And Parag Patel, I'm, I can't remember where exactly he is, but Dr. Parag Patel was on there as well. And so I was I was catching a glimpse and uh, before we began here with John Robbins, the CEO of Biomedics, he and I were peering in. He says, where to go? And I'm like, oh, no, we had to pull it down because the show is going to start. Our show is going to start. <laughs> so but that's going on all day. So a lot of doctors do take time, you know, in their own, in their spare time, even like you going down to San Diego, flying clear, clear across the country um, to go to these events. But then you have, um, you know, folks like Pegasus that are doing ones virtually um, on a weekend to democratize access to those physicians who can't get away. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense to not not that we all want to, you know, completely live and breathe and spend all of our hours doing this type of work. But, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. And if you can get something done on the weekend, and even if it's just jumping on for a half hour, an hour and learning about something new, I think it's very beneficial. So kudos to those physicians who are, I'm not familiar with Pegasus, um, but uh, yeah, kudos to those that are doing uh, God's work, as we say, um, trying to get better. You know, <laughs> you, you joke about, we don't want to live, eat, breathe it. <laughs> but I was last night I was on, uh, everyone in the world knows I'm single, 48 and single, right? So I'm on Bumble. So no surprise. I'm on Bumble. There's dating app. And, right. you know, a couple of years ago, I joked that I met a, an orthopedic surgeon and I, he asked me what I did. Well, that's always a loaded question. Of course, I'm going to get on my soapbox, especially with another doctor and get excited about all the advances in saving life and limb. And he had this funny look on his face and he says to me, oh my God, you, you mean they can open up those vessels below the knee and into the foot? I've been just cutting off legs. And so I thought, well, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I should be dating really more doctors. <laughs> Maybe that'll help to spread the word that life and limb can be saved. And the same thing last night, I had an amazing uh, emergency room doctor that is um, touring, you know, the Bay Area right now that happened to show up in my location. And he's saving life and limb here in um, in the Bay Area at a couple of the hospitals. Um, he's from Washington. And and he, he was like, oh, wow, you just taught me something. I'll be sending some patients your way to help facilitate limb saving care. He's like, thanks. You know, so, Maybe I not to, stay single. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's a perfect example of mixing business with pleasure. But yes. what's always, again, it's just the the fact that physicians, you know, and and again, I don't know the latest and greatest in orthopedic care or emergency medicine care, but you know, the the fact that people are like, oh yeah, I didn't know they could do that, just reinforces what what we need to do with respect to education. Um, not only on the patient side of things, but also yeah. physician side of things for PAD and, and CLI. Exactly. So I think it's about time for a moment of inspiration before we get into our big conversation of the day. Dr. John Phillips, spectacular vascular moment of inspiration. So I have a quote today from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I'm currently reading the book called um, The Arsenal of Democracy. So basically it is around the time of World War II when we started mass producing, among other things, the B-24 bomber to defeat Hitler. <clears throat> and so I thought, all right, let me find a, a good FDR quote. And then I realized, you know what? My father used to say this. So this is a two for one. Um, but I I like this one quote, never put off until tomorrow that which you can do today. And an oldie but goodie, an oldie but goodie. But then the next one is, I like this one too, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So, you know, a lot of what we do in the medical space is, um, you know, you hope you prepare for the worst, hope for the best. And you can sometimes get a, we call it paralysis by analysis and th that can paralyze you too much. So it's a fine line of kind of working through these things. But my, my, my quote and my pledge or my, my plea to everyone out listening do today and don't put things off. Yeah, that, that is so important. And be ready to be ready to be ready to be ready. My, my favorite quote. Okay, we're going to be ready to be ready, be ready for a very powerful conversation. Joining us will be John Robin, CEO of Biomedics. Stay with us and don't go away. Leg health can indicate risk for... Everyone's clear on that side. 
Man, I love the rolling. I love the rolling of the music. Yeah. That's kind of cool. <clears throat> nice job, Colin. We're not letting you go anywhere. That's what this company said to me. Kim, I, I see we're both wearing red today, so that's that's kind of fun. That is fun. Are, is that is yours red though? I can't. I mean, I'm assuming it's it looks hot, magenta over here. Hot hot, 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 pink. Gotcha. Okay. Hot pink. Love it. I know it's it's good. John, are you in, in the other John? Oh my lord. Um, so yeah, I have to call you Doctor Phillips. All right. Um, you can just say Doctor John. Let's pretend I'm. Well, I won't. I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes no, like John, it, uh, you couldn't have had more fun on a Saturday than being with us. I'm just saying. Oh, well, if you can hear me, uh, the irony is I'm literally looking at the lacrosse field with a beanie cap and ski gear on in the uh, <laughs> great state of Minnesota. Ah, there you go. Oh, Minnesotan? Minnesota. Yes. Oh, we got some pop. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. John, I'm actually from born and raised in wisconsin so I, I know what it feels like to be frigid most yeah most yeah. of the year the uh the driveway is still in threat of being plowed uh right into may oh that oh yeah yeah we talking yeah. three inches or four inches of snow also 30 <laughs> seconds till we air okay um john do you want to take us in dr john do you want to take us in because you guys can joke about your lacrosse and then get into the the convo on you know we do want to kind of lead in a little bit, and I want to get your take on the Science Direct article because it's interesting that we don't talk about, we don't hear this because all we're hearing is. Heads up, Dr. Pepper, 10 seconds to wear. You know, too many procedures, too many procedures, and it's an old person's disease, yeah, and don't test principle. them young. This is 860 so. AM, The Answer. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So, Kim, before we jump into the democratization of, you know, PAD and some of the new technologies Testing. out there, yeah. how did you stumble across this article in, I believe it's in cardiovascular revascularization medicine. Um, did, was this sent to you or did, were you just kind of. It was posted was... actually on, on LinkedIn by okay. Podymetrics and, you know, Podymetrics uh, has a device that is used to help detect ulcers before they emerge in diabetic patients. And the CEO, John Bloom posted it. And then our global advocate for PAD out of South <laughs> Africa, Sally Hendricks, ended up also tagging me. So I got tagged twice in it. And so I thought I'm supposed to read this article. And of course, I'm glad I did. Well, I, I would just say that oftentimes, and I'm as biased as the next physician, and I'm a guy that kind of lives in, in this space all the time. If When we look, see somebody who's under 40 that might have the PAD, you're scratching your head like, hmm, are we sure this is PAD? But to your point, the fact that we have this rise in pre-diabetics and then ultimately type two diabetics with the obesity and the poor diet, it, it doesn't really surprise me. I, frankly, I've never seen someone under 25, I think that actually had true peripheral arterial disease, yeah. but, but the, the, the young white females who are small, smaller body habitus and smokers, we see that I'm seeing that more, uh, more uh, common now. I mean, it's not super common, but I'm seeing that more often, I think. Here's something that might be worth thinking about. How many of these might have been a misdiagnosis as PAD, especially in the white women, as it might have been popliteal entrapment? Yeah, I mean, that's a... That's, I've seen a misdiagnosis with that. Yeah, that, that is... A, yep, and that is a misdiagnosis, particularly in young athletic females right. where, you know, the, the muscles is trapping or just by the way, the artery kind of comes out behind the knee, it gets trapped, but like, honestly, true atherosclerotic peripheral arterial disease is pretty rare in people without risk factors. But I mean, they mentioned risk factors here in this article. So diabetes, tobacco abuse. I mean, I think if we just got rid of tobacco and, and really focused on lifestyle modification, mm -hmm. we could nip this in the bud pretty quickly 
not nip it completely, but at least start to prune it back a little bit. And, you know, with our organization, we have had quite a few, we've seen an influx as well in the number of patients that have come to us under the age of 40 with their doctors refusing to even offer any sort of exam, a vascular assessment of them saying, it's not even possible, it's not even worth our time to order an exam. Go ahead, eat a banana, not kidding. Eat a banana, go get blood work to test, you know, for any sort of nutrient deficiency, magnesium, potassium, whatever it might be. Oh, maybe you need to drink more water. I mean, all of that jazz. And literally most of the ones that came our way did in fact have pad mm -hmm. and they were just brushed off. And so um, that was one of the um, factors for us saying, hey, we need to democratize access to PAD testing. We need to let people know where they can get the testing in clinic, because I think that really democratizes access and it reduces the amount of time between a patient actually complaining of symptoms and getting diagnosed and then to getting treatment so that it doesn't escalate to the advanced stage of CLI or, or critical limb ischemia sooner rather than later. And so one of the issues that you and I have talked about before in this is that a lot of primary care doctors don't know any, don't know very much about PAD and they're, they're not following this as much as we are on a daily basis. And so that's why there's a company called Biomedics and we have John Romans, the CEO who's on right now. And what I like about what they're doing is that they're targeting the primary care clinics and the podiatrists because those are typically frontline, especially for diabetics, because diabetics go to the podiatrist to get their nails cut. That's covered, right, by most insurance. And so if they can get to the primary care doctors and the podiatrists that have PAD testing equipment in clinic where their staff is trained for it, they can get tested sooner rather than later by someone who is more experienced with PAD. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic. I mean, so a lot of what we talk about, and I can't wait to to get uh, talking with John because I, on the or off air, we were just both discussing that you know lacrosse, and he's freezing right now in Minnesota, um, so I'm really excited to talk to him. But I mean, there's a couple of things. Number one, we talk about trying to be more proactive and taking care of these people. Right. And so it's, it's screening tests like this, because the sensitivity and specificity of an accurate, of an ABI is upwards of 90 high nineties. It's more sensitive and specific than mammograms and, and, and PSA and things like that. So how do we get these things in the hands of people who are at risk, but don't yet know it? And it got me thinking real quick, because, you know, one of the things that we are doing with the men's health clinic that that I'm starting this franchise called Game Game Day Men's Health out of uh, Carlsbad, California. But we're doing free PSA testing and raising awareness for prostate cancer. And so it's like any opportunity, and plus all these kind of concierge like um, medi medica medical medical uh, facilities are popping up. But if you can offer free testing, or and you know obviously we eat the cost or whatever, I think in the long run you're you're doing the right thing. So should we welcome John? I think so. Hi, John. Thanks for for your patience. Oh, uh, Dr. John and Kim, thanks. It's a real pleasure. And I think kicking things off, how were the games on your end? We had a win, 11 to 1 on our end. Um, We got smoked 14 to 4. I actually oh, left wow. and went to the other soccer game. <laughs> 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 See, I'm uh, used to watching I'm used to watching soccer where it's like one nil or two one or something. And I thought, wow, they're scoring a lot here. So this isn't good for us. <laughs> <laughs> well then next time. Well, mm -hmm. thank you for having me on. Um, it's a real pleasure and I've absolutely enjoyed everything I've heard so far. Oh good. Woo, we didn't bore you. We didn't, you know. <laughs> Kimmy's still awake. This is great. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much. Um, and, and, you know, before we get into it, we can actually just mention the fact that we do have this partnership because I was leading into it. And I love the fact that you're offering this testing equipment for PAD in clinics, um, you know, as frontline. And I'm curious, you know, was this, you know, part of, you know, why you, you did that is because we were struggling on the front lines with primary care, being educated and, um, getting the patients the the order to go get, I mean, direct to these primary care, I would think would make a big difference. You know, it really is interesting in that uh, initially 
we were focused where the specialists were in hospitals, uh, in vascular labs. And we realized that the expertise, the personnel, the technology was readily available there. But the problem was that patients certainly didn't know how to necessarily navigate to uh, meet up and receive the expert services of specialists. Yeah. And often, if found early, these conditions can be managed effectively within the primary care. But there are some other complications with the primary care. For instance, there is just the um, some hesitancy, for instance, in primary care about um, encroaching on another physician's uh, medical area of practice. So yes. uh, often there is a little bit of reluctancy because there is concern that maybe they shouldn't be getting involved in diagnosing low extremity arterial disease or looking for uh, leg disease because another physician might not be happy about that. So these community-based collaborations, which you have been so fantastic in establishing, and we are big, big believers um, that working with specialists to help to educate the primary care who have access and relationships with those patients, our job is to provide them with technology and training to do these very simple, but as Dr. Phillips has mentioned, accurate studies, and then make that information readily available securely and remotely to specialists so they can work together to take care of those patients. More from John Roman, CEO of Biomedics, coming up in a moment. Stay with us. Three years ago, my symptoms started with... Everyone's clear on that side. Uh, question for Marsha really quick. Marsha, um, wasn't it a, was it a nurse practitioner that, that ended up in a community clinic that ended up doing this? Or was it the hospital? I can't remember. Um, that gave me my ABI test? Yeah. Um, I was sent to... A hospital it was yeah it was at well, a i hospital. mean who who told you first though that it was wow. a was it a nurse practitioner or was it a i can't remember um uh i i don't remember i mean my primary care doctor thought i had pad and sent me for an abi test and it obviously you know i had a 100 percent occlusion i i oh. think then i went to see dr coral i believe no, I just was wondering just in, in terms of the fact that it was a community, it was a clinic, it was a, you know, I just. Yeah, no, I, I went to a hospital. I went to oh, Miami Valley Hospital. Oh, yes. gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just yeah. curious. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's been, I, I really think that this is the right way to go, what you guys are doing in the in the smaller clinics and going after them because this is where the, uh, this is where the most vulnerable communities are. They all can't get to a hospital or like in, in our community in Marin County, all of our clinics are all literally located around. They have two monopolies here um, with Marin Health and the other one with UCSF. And so, sure. but all of the clinics all are right around the hospitals. But what about those that are in more of the outskirts areas? And this is where some of the most vulnerable communities are and they can't always get to where the hospital is. And we struggle with that because we provide transportation for patients when their um, insurance can't. And so you guys providing it to some of these smaller clinics that are not necessarily at the hospital um, is really beneficial. Uh, uh, we totally agree. And there's also, I mean, typically one of two things happens. Either uh, a primary care just refers everybody to the specialists, uh, those including the worried well, um, or maybe you're having indications for other reasons, or they're just not referring anyone until it is in such advanced late stages. Yeah. Neither are great. Yeah, John, no. I'm, I'm curious. And I think when we come back from the break, I'll get you, I'll ask you to dive a little bit deeper into this, but the, so what the clinic buys the device and then they obviously have to have a charge for the patient billing their insurance and then they get the facility fee for the for the um the abi is that how that works yeah it's a great question so we we provide the equipment to them either through sale or lease uh they perform the study typically a medical assistant performs the test and then um in the sort of ideal world a, a vascular subspecialist in the community remotely provides an impression you can have an interprofessional consultation. Heads up, seven up, 10 seconds till we air. 
So I guess. they take the okay. tech fee and the reader takes, the specialist takes the pro fee. Okay. 860 AM, The Answer. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. I love I love the fact that Kim and I have been doing this for so long that you know right before we go on air we'll point to each other as to who's bringing us back. <laughs> so and anyway, it makes it so it, easy on the same it, page. It does. I was like me. She's like yes. Okay. Uh, so welcome back, everybody. Want to continue our conversation with John Romans, uh, CEO of Bio Biomet Metrics, right? Uh, yep. When they have a Biomedics. Biomedics. Um, a what sounds like a, a kind of a portable ish uh, ABI machine that allows for a uh, very simple uh, assessment of blood flow in folks that might have peripheral arterial disease. So before we went on air, John, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the trepidation that you had found with some of the primary care physicians ordering, um, you know, this test. Because frankly, when I see somebody who might have peripheral arterial disease, I, I want to say maybe 50% don't have any non-invasive imaging that or, or testing for that matter, that actually confirms it. So, I mean, wow. we, the ABI, a normal ABI is one. Okay. So basically we've talked about this, but you, inf you, the blood flow and the pressure from the blood, from the blood vessels, you know, exerted, you know, around the ankle or the arm should be equal in some, someone who doesn't have any blockages. So if the, if the number is less than one, we think there might be some blockages potentially and most likely in the legs. So if you have a, a number less than 0.9, that ratio, then you're diagnosed with peripheral arterial disease and we kind of treat you uh, appropriately. But um, a lot of times folks come in and they don't have any testing. So then I have to order it and it almost it delays a little bit of what I'm able to do. So it's kind of nice that this is is being um, uh, this is available to to physicians in their clinics to at least get a baseline for us to to, to move forward. Completely agree. And in fact, we know that access to vascular specialists such as yourself and your expert teams and facilities are a priority. And we really want to kind of make sure that the patients that you're spending your time with are those that have been identified as needing that expert service. And so this is, a we think, a really exciting role for the primary care physicians who can be a frontline support earlier diagnosis, which then comes with all sorts of exciting options on how that patient is managed, often, by the way, that are much less expensive when you find the disease earlier. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Um, if, if you want, John, do you want to, Dr. John, do you want to go into just the, the stages of PAD and why it's so important to diagnose this sooner and how much um, a patient can do as a partner in their own care if they are diagnosed early to prevent it from progressing to advanced stages? Yeah, sure. So um, peripheral arterial disease, there's about 220 million people in the world that have it. Um, of that, like, so for example, in the US, uh, there's probably 10 or 11 million people, um, maybe 2 million of those have peripheral arterial uh, the critical limb ischemia. So like the, the most severe form of it. So when we talk about peripheral arterial disease, again, the, the, the kind of keystone of our diagnosis is this ABI that, that we've talked about and, and the device that, um, um, biomedics has, uh, kind of point of care, which is awesome. I think it's fantastic. Um, but, uh, so, uh, 50% of patients that have abnormal ABIs have no symptoms, and that doesn't mean that they're not at risk. It just means that the blockage isn't bad enough for them to have the aching and heaviness when they walk. But that also means we have to treat them as though they, well, treat them because they have the disease, which means change their diet, talk about tobacco cessation, talk about um, their blood glucose levels, make sure they're, you know, not if they have diabetes, make sure it's well controlled. And then first and foremost, address their their lipid profiles and consider medication to reduce their cholesterol. And then if you have symptoms, we talk about how bad they are, mild, moderate, severe. And that kind of, uh, that range depends on when the symptoms start. So someone with mild peripheral arterial disease can 
you know, walk, let's say a, a hundred yards of football field. And then, then the leg starts to cramp up, goes away when they rest moderate. It's a, it's shorter. And then severe patients with severe peripheral arterial disease, they'll uh, endorse discomfort with just a short walk to potentially from the parking lot to the door of our clinic. And then those that have severe PAD, but ulcers, then they have that, that critical limb ischemia. So those are kind of the stages. But if you've been diagnosed with it and don't have any symptoms, we still want to make sure we're reducing your modifiable risk factors. Yeah, I think that that's so important. And, and that's why, you know, democratizing access for those who have high risk factors, we have the ARC Act that is in Congress right now, and it keeps stalling out. And the ARC Act would democratize um, access to PAD testing, you know, just as you would, uh, you know, have a colonoscopy covered, just as you would have a mammogram covered for potential breast cancer. What we are hoping for with the ARC Act, if if it would stop stalling out in Congress, um, I heard, I, I know who the uh, holdouts are. Um, we just got to get the word out that, you know what, this is more prevalent and deadlier than all cancers combined, except for lung cancer. And people do not have access to the testing because insurance may not cover it. But if it's in the clinic, frontline with a primary care doctor or with a podiatrist, and they say you have a high risk factor for it, you have diabetes, you smoke, you're, especially for those over 40, um, we can test you right here in the clinic, right, John? Absolutely. And you know, th that Amputation Reduction and Compassion Act or the ARC Act, it really is. This is one that I just don't think Congress has, has had the opportunity to fully appreciate uh, what's being done in that for people to understand that all that is being asked is that a quick and easy study is done before an amputation. You know, just don't amputate before looking to see if the limb can be saved. And uh, yeah. I, I really do hope that this comes around and is supported. That's like jumping out of an airplane before you figure out you have a parachute. Makes absolutely no sense to me. <laughs> Completely agree. Yeah. And coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we'll have more with John Romans and details of this partnership between the Global PAD Association and Biomedics and where you can find out about pad testing sites near you. So stay with us. Everyone's clear on that side. Thank you, Colin. Um, we should, I, it'd be great. Um, I don't know, John, um, Dr. John, if you're familiar with their technology. What I love about that it is, is that it's combined with the ABI, PVR, and the um, TBI. And so it's an all-in-one device. And what's even more interesting is that you don't need to have an actual trained um, technician it can be a nurse practitioner. It can be a nurse in the office. It can be, um, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but it, it really, I love the word democratizing. It's my favorite word in the whole world. So a, let's see how lot many of, times. A lot of syllables too. A lot of syllables. It does. And I think Joshua has his Bloody Mary there. Then I think that we'll just make him take a sip every time I say it. <laughs> oh, I uh, went for the hair of the dog this afternoon for lunch. Wow. Well done. He's in North Who Carolina on vacation. <laughs> John, can we, is it, is it, uh, I don't want to um, get you into, go down a rabbit hole, but I'm always curious about cost. Sure. And, um, you know, two things, I guess, cost and then validation against, you know, the, the big old machine that we have in our hospitals yeah. um, that is, that is running ABIs. Um, is that fair to talk about? It, it, it sure is. And um, I mean, just so you've got a heads up, uh, the device that Kim's referring to, our PadNet Express, is um, for a couple hundred dollars a month, uh, two ninety nine a month. The, the practice can have it, unlimited use, fully supported uh, and trained, uh, very easy to use on the sensitivity and specificity. We have really nice data set, and I can um, uh, send that to you as well. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll um, hook up with you on LinkedIn if that's okay. Of course. Or if you're, of course. Okay. I'll send you yeah, because John, one of the things that they do is they're looking for um, and what we help them with is we help them find, you know, vascular specialists like yourself that is willing to read the results and 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 analyze them for for them as well. Yeah. Yeah, because th there used to be. I'm oh, sorry. 
Well, Kim, just a quick question uh, to make sure I'm promoting. Uh, with respect to uh, our collaboration, things that we're doing to support this, is there anything specific that you want to make sure I touch on? Um, well, the fact that we're, we're sending people, it's the importance of why are we targeting primary care and, and podiatry? And that's really our focus, you know, to make sure, you know, we're, we're, you know, patients struggle with their, when their primary care doesn't understand what PAD yeah. is. And that's the number one thing is we find this so much, uh, and this is interesting, more than 70% of our patients that we pulled out of nearly 500 actually told us that when they first presented with textbook sat PAD symptoms, they were misdiagnosed. The top misdiagnosis include diabetic neuropathy, back problems, fibromyalgia, arthritis, and Oh, John, what was the, the oh, shoot, what was the fifth one? Forget what the fifth one was. But anyway, they were misdiagnosed. They presented with textbook symptoms. So the fact that these patients are getting to a doctor who understands and they, you can tell that they understand because they're, they've adopted your technology. I think that that's going to increase the number of patients that are going to Heads be up diagnosed. Seven up, sooner 10 seconds to Lear. So it's padtest.org is where we're going. It's a.m. The answer. We could include vascular specialists, of course, but most insurance requires. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Let's uh, jump right back into our conversation. So John, your device had net, um, the one that I'm looking at right now looks like a shin guard that has the kind of, that's, I mean, it's, it's pretty sleek looking. It's small. Um, it's a lot different than the device that we have in our hospital that kind of looks like a 1970s IBM computer. So, you know, I look at that device and I say, well, there's a lot of bells and whistles on this thing. It must give us a better ABI reading and, and, and toe pressure reading than your device. But you would, you would argue that that might not be the case, right? I would. I would argue that if you looked at your first cell phone, it probably looked more like your shoe than, uh, than your phone does today. So sim similar changes over time. Um, what is exciting is that while it's a much smaller uh, device, it is uh, a fully functioning, powerful physiologic device. So it should be able to do the studies. Um, to be certain, there is equipment that without question you have in your lab that uh, is far more expensive, uh, requires expert personnel to, to operate it. But what's, what's great is today, uh, technology like our PadNet technology is easily used in a primary care setting by their team they can perform these studies uh, like an ABI uh, to do a quick screen and then get that information um, readily available to someone like you so that you can remotely review those inf that, that information, provide a diagnosis, and then provide guidance on treatment plans, which I think is one of the things that the primary care community really enjoys, that they get that remote access from a specialist like you, uh, and there isn't any compromise to the level of care to the patient. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, let me, let's, can we talk profit and loss real quick? So sure. let's say I'm a primary care doctor. I'm listening to the show and hopefully there are many, and I'm interested in getting your device. Walk me through what that looks like, not only with cost, um, but you know, how do I get that month? Where's the, because again, at the end of the day, as much as we hate to say that it's a business, so you need a return on your investment, but walk us through that. And then kind of the, the training that has to happen because in our, in our lab, we have a trained um, ultrasound uh, sonographers who have, you know, gone to school to um, do among other things, ABIs. Yeah, that's great. And so, and there's no question. In fact, I think like many uh, parts of medicine, primary care, often it feels like the only way to maintain the revenue that you've had in the past is to see more patients and to see more patients that means even less time with each patient and care suffers physician and care provider burnout are, are rampant uh, especially post-pandemic 
So finding ways where we can deliver better care in a sustainable way financially so that there's enough money in it for them to be able to keep doing this uh, with their existing patients is something that we really want to focus on. So more directly, break even for uh, physicians is one study a week. If they can see one patient a week to perform one of these uh, PADNET tests, uh, that is the break even uh, for the expense associated with the technology. So real quick follow up, and then I know Kim wants to interject, but so I have to have a diagnosis though, which typically, I mean, pain in the legs, I think gets it covered, but I mean, I can't just, I mean, I can do these on my own, but I'm or for free, right? But I'm not getting reimbursed. Is that correct? correct. Okay. It, without, it, without indications in traditional Medicare or in commercial insurance, there needs to be an indication. Indications and I could think be, for most of these oh, patient, high risk factors, right? High it, blood it, pressure, it, high cholesterol. That's right. As you've said, if you have, uh, and it, this new research is showing it's even younger, but right. the traditional understanding is that if you are 50 years old or older with a history of smoking or diabetes, or if you're Medicare age, so say 65 or older, a third of those patients alone uh, have PAD. And then as you have these other indications, that prevalence rate uh, grows significantly. What resistance do you have with the primary care and the podiatry offices as your sales folks knock on doors to try and urge them to integrate PADNET or PAD testing overall into their practice? Well, it, you know, so uh, when they, they first wonder about the cost and then we can show them that uh, expense not a hurdle. So we really, that's not an issue. But um, we were speaking maybe offline before, but the concern that they're encroaching on another physician's business, right? Uh, especially vascular specialists, is a concern. That's why it's so critical to hear from vascular experts like Dr. Phillips that, in fact, they want to encourage that collaboration. Um, being educated to realize that they have access to these at-risk patients and a relationship with these patients that other healthcare providers uh, don't have. So to leverage that so we can get better care delivered to their patients earlier is critical. Um, another concern is worrying about diagnosing a condition that they're not an expert in. And now they're in an awkward position of not knowing what to do other than saying you have a disease. So being able to collaborate effectively, remotely, securely with specialists so that they can get their impressions uh, from a specialist and some ideas on how to treat this is extremely helpful and empowering for the primary care. So let me ask you this, because I, there are some times when I'll get like a life and what are the life lifeline life or life. You know, yeah, yeah I'll, get one of those, yeah. I'll get one of those abis and i'm like there's no way that this is accurate because i can feel the patient's pulses and so have you experienced any pushback from people that run vascular labs or you know vascular specialists as like yeah your tests it, it may you know i don't believe it and now so now i have to repeat it in my own lab which i wanted to get to this too we charge an exorbitant amount of money to bill and bill for for an ABI, which is a, I mean, I, I don't want to say what it is, but it's a heck of a lot more than I thought it would be. Um, sure. And so any opportunity to decrease the cost to the patient is, is fabulous. But getting back to my initial question, have you, have you run into any pushback from vascular specialists? Like, yeah, I don't believe these results. I have to repeat them, you know, do a, my ABI. Well, um, so sometimes we do. And the okay. reasoning behind those uh, can differ. Uh, sometimes it's because uh, they would like to, uh, for a business reason, um, do it. I also think, as, as Kim mentioned, our technology, we use the term ABI, and that, that is true uh, in what we're doing, but we're, we're taking some additional information as well. Um, and, and, and so we really are excited and proud of the sensitivity and specificity of, of the technology. With over a million studies performed around the, um, the country, mm -hmm. uh, thousands of, of practices. And as you might imagine, over that time, the technology has improved. Uh, so being able to take in that feedback, um, look to find ways to improve the technology is something that we're constantly looking uh, to do. But I, my final comment on that is that I really shifted 
our company's focus from being in a mindset of disease management to a mindset of health management. And if we want to be focused on population health, rather than simply focusing on at the end stage when disease is so severe, how to at best save the limb, um, uh, if not at least save the life, is, is I think, a, a much more exciting way to look at it. And, and so getting to these uh, people, getting to their, our, our population sooner with screening, it, it will be finding disease in mild and, and sometimes uh, it, it turns out that uh, under your expert eye, you would say they do not have disease. But I think the upside of taking care of patients with maybe having some referrals to you that turn out don't have a disease that's ready for you it, is well worth it. And on I, that I note, agree. we're going to send it off to break. And again, when we come back in the last few moments, we're going to share with you how you can find a pad testing site near you. So stay with us. Waves were mighty and Only one minute till we air. Everyone's clear right now. Um, it's interesting that you were mentioning, you know, on the encroaching, you know, on that, because I've talked to vascular surgeons and the Society of for Vascular Surgery, and they don't want patients in the early stage. I mean, they're tapped out. I know even with, you know, John, most of the vascular specialists I know are so overworked, overburdened with so many different patients that if we can get people diagnosed sooner and so they don't have to get to them, um, is, is really a good thing at the very least get these patients to a cardiologist for medicine management or a general vascular medicine doctor. I love vascular medicine. And I know Cleveland Clinic is training folks in vascular medicine. And I think there's a special certification in that. And if we can promote really that vascular medicine. As Heads a up, seven up, 10 seconds till we air. I think it'd be really great. Who's coming back? You want me to? Okay. This is 860 AM. The answer. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Hi, hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. We're talking to John Roman, CEO of Biomedics. They have a PAD testing device that they're providing to frontline doctors, especially primary care physicians and podiatrists, which I think is so important. I attend conferences around the world, and, and one of the biggest complaints from the vascular specialists is we're not getting these patients soonest. And why is that? It's because maybe primary care physicians around the world there are a lot of them that may not be trained in PAD to a point where they can spot these patients in the earlier stages of PAD. So they're presenting later. And what biomedics does is they, they're putting these testing devices in the hands of these physicians to be able to perform these tests in their clinics. And I think it's so important to have that because more than 70% of patients in our network with the Global PAD Association that were pulled out of 500 said that when they presented to their primary care physician, textbook symptoms of leg pain, neuropathy, leg cramps, they were misdiagnosed with diabetic neuropathy, back problems, arthritis, fibromyalgia, and old age. And so being able to get these devices into these clinics and being able to direct patients who have these symptoms and high risk factors, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, former smoker, current smoker, high um, cholesterol, et cetera, they can say to their doctor and actually choose a doctor that may know a little bit more about PAD. And that's why together with um, Biomedics, the Global PAD Association is launching padtest.org. And that's where you can find a primary care um, or podiatrist possibly in your area that offers pad testing and may know a little bit more. And the whole goal is not only to help educate the patients and to get them to the right doctor if they think they have pad, but also to inspire other primary care physicians to want to be on this finder and be able to go to biomedics and say, hey, we want one of those devices in our clinics. We want to learn more about pad and help to democratize access to this testing so we can prevent these patients from showing up a toe step away from amputation. Well, John, I mean, did it, you want to contribute? Yes. It's 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 the old adage, the eyes see what the mind knows. 
And, you know, you have to be looking for it in order to or know about it, but also be looking for it. But so I think it's it's fantastic. And, and over break, too, we had talked about the fact that a lot of us are just we we're seeing a lot of patients who already have symptomatic PAD. But those that don't have symptomatic PAD also need to be treated, too. And I would have no problem if somebody sent me a result and they said, what should I do with this? And I would say, well, OK, they've got mild PAD. You need to do this, 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 and this. They don't have to come see me. And now you have hopefully gotten the person to maybe turn right instead of left down a road that is that leads to better longevity and less complications from PAD. And, you know, to, on that comment, I think what we really love, and we get to live vicariously through care providers such as your, yourself, is that often as a patient, finding the, um, a, a, a session with a specialist uh, if it's then said, okay, we're, we don't need to do anything. These are things we need to do, but it, it's a little catch and release and that it's hard given all the other demands, uh, to stay in contact with that patient in a way that's a, appropriate, but primary care can. So right. part of that recommendation can be, um, we've talked about tobacco cessation, supervised exercise therapy, nutritional counseling, and then let's do a follow-up study in six to 12 months much more easily to do at a primary care setting. And then you have that ability to stay connected to the primary care community and those patients in a way that, again, I think is sustainable. Yeah. And, and you haven't, you know, so it's like you, you've, you've tethered yourself. I personally have now tethered myself, or maybe the PCP is tethered to me regarding, okay, they've got a lifeline through a vascular specialist to kind of bounce ideas off of and, or, you know, treatment plans and things. And then if, if, and when that patient does become symptomatic, boom, I know about it and I can, you know, help them and, and get them expedited. Exactly. Thank you so much. John Romans, CEO of Biomedics. Thank you for taking time. And I'm really excited about this partnership between Biomedics and the Global PAD Association. If anyone wants to find a pad testing site near them, go to padtest.org. You've been listening to The Heart of Innovation with Emmy Award. Thank you so much. Um, I am really excited about this. We're going into our after show. John, if you have a few moments, we may have a few questions from patients who are on and John might have, Dr. John might have a few thoughts as well. We have quite a few folks with PAD on the line. You may have even a question for them that they might be able to speak on. Um, but sure. um, happy to open up the floor. I'll, I'll just say, if, if you don't mind, I like the idea of using a de devices like these that are, it sounds like pretty simple, but yet provide a, a wealth of information. I saw on your website, you, you guys offer Venus testing as well. I mean, so like uh, the, the machine will, and I hate to boil it down to, return on the investment, but the machine will pay for itself because when I order an ABI on somebody and yes, over 50 with risk factors, all you really have to say is that they have pain in their legs with those risk factors and it gets covered. Now it's a little bit more dicey in a younger person, but you can, you know, assuming they have an abnormal vascular exam or something. So it's not really hard to get the order in and the insurance companies to pay for the ABI. And so I think it's just, it's a wonderful thing that you guys are doing, trying to um, educate uh, more, more providers and, and put good mm -hmm. technology in their hands. Well, I appreciate it. And, you know, on that, that topic, it, it is interesting also though, to have patients um, kind of accurately represent what they're experiencing in their legs. I have witnessed firsthand with patients where I can see the skin is almost like rice paper. They have little um, uh, wounds, ulcers. And when asked if uh, they're experiencing leg pain, the big guy said no. And we said, okay, but if your mother, if we asked your mother, if she was experiencing what you're experiencing, what would she say? And he'd say, hurts like hell. <laughs> and and yeah. so getting, you know, getting the right people, getting the people to sort of represent what they're experiencing can be challenging at times. It is. For example, my dad, he he's actually experiencing what most people, 24 would seven would consider a uh, level six in pain. And mm -hmm. he's telling the doctor, he goes to the orthopedic doctor and says, oh, it, it's, it's a level three and I have it all the time. And the doctor was like, yeah, fine, go home, suck it <laughs> up, you're great, no problem. <laughs> and I was like, 
you told him you have a level three. I mean, yeah. in, in what world? He, you know, he has high, he has a very high pain tolerance, but he's a former military guy. Yeah. And so yeah. his level three is actually our level yeah. six. Yeah. And along the, it's so it's interesting. That's why it's, I always tell patients, bring a quote consultant with you to the visit if you can, because they're going to call you out. I had a gentleman that was referred to me. He had an abnormal ABI and he wasn't particularly symptomatic and I, and I said, well, do you know why you're here? And he's like, well, yeah, he points to his wife. She made me come in. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's the same thing. It's like pulling teeth. They're like, are you having any symptoms? No. Yes. Okay. Right. Well, tell me what you do. And then it's like, okay, you tease it out. But if I'm a primary care doc, I'm moving on. Like, okay, your legs don't bother you anymore. All right, moving on. Next problem. Yeah. Uh, and so I understand it's how difficult it is for PCPs to deal with this. So to that and extent, sometimes what we encourage is to um, to screen at risk patients uh, a little easier to work into the clinical workflow. You can have a medical assistant uh, do that as as part of that pre physician face to face meeting. And if you have that abnormal uh, ABI uh, that you did now, now you have something to work with the patient to sort of show also that uh, there's evidence that there is something obstructing blood flow and, mm -hmm. and to talk about that. And we have a message on YouTube from Marsha Burr. She's wondering how to get these devices in the hands of rural doctors and communities that don't have access to more specialized facilities. Love the, uh, the question. And in fact, if uh, there's a specific community uh, of interest, that's just, we have to do the work to get there. Um, but in today's world and the way we can communicate that is much easier than 20 plus years ago when we started. So I uh, would love to uh, be able to collaborate more effectively in rural communities. Uh, I really do think that's an important part of the future role of primary care. And I think that's something that we can even put a poll in our groups and find out who has access to primary care uh, physicians and who who doesn't, who has to drive, you know, we have a couple patients that have to drive at least 45 minutes to an hour to get to someone. And many of them have to rely upon friends because they don't even have cars themselves. Sure. sure. And so that's tough. We do have Douglas that has a question, I believe, if he is still on somewhere. Douglas, go ahead and unmute. Yeah, my question is for both Johns. What is one of the toughest things you run into today in getting this I information out there and with the insurance and with your primary? What is one of the toughest things you've run into today? John, you want to take that? Uh, sure. I'd say, so we're talking about leg disease specifically. And I think one of the challenges is um, getting people to appreciate it as a worthwhile and important and a dangerous condition when you talk about a leg attack versus a heart attack or a brain attack. So a stroke or a brain attack, people understand it, don't want that to happen. Heart attacks, I think everybody um, appreciates. But when you talk about a, a blockage in your leg, I think people, they discount the impact. And uh, yes. so that's one of the challenges is to um, achieve that sort of priority and focus on, on leg disease. Uh, and it's uh, interesting, and to Dr. John, is three in five people who suffer a heart attack, I think I saw, have PAD. And how much easier would your job be to prevent heart attacks if you could get more patients diagnosed sooner with PAD? Well, I mean, a lot easier. And then the, 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 the thing that I struggle with is, and we've talked about this before, it's just, it's lack of awareness. PAD is not a quote and don't, I mean, I'm not discounting any, you know, cancer movement or anything, but it's not a sexy disease. Right. Um, you know, to your point, there's a, there's a handful of cancers that are more deadly than PAD, but patients don't recognize it. Patients often don't, when they see, you know, a black dot on the tip of their toe, it, it doesn't set alarm bells off when, but you find a lump somewhere that sets alarm bells off. And, and I think, I don't know how we fix that, but, you know, we're certainly trying to do our best to answer Douglas's question. I don't have a, I don't, to get an ABI or any vascular tests is very easy. 
what we're running into trouble now is with insurance companies um, covering the angiograms that 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 I do, and they're often like asking me to to say if I'm going to put a stent in or what am I going to do ahead of time before I've even kind of laid out the anatomy, so to speak, and got an understanding of what the blood flow is. And I think it's that is part and parcel to what has happened over the last year or so yeah. with the overuse of, of, or the perceived overuse, but there is overuse of some of these high payment, high, highly reimbursed devices that have put a black eye on what we do, frankly. I mean, it's the old adage, uh, a few bad apples spoil the whole bunch. I know, you know, it's even more interesting though about this. And I just spoke at the, um, the vascular leaders forum through Viva in Washington, DC on exactly that topic it, in that patients, when I pulled them after reading a New York times article that led to a big discussion about the overutilization of devices um, for revascularization or opening up the arteries in minimally invasive ways. Um, the patients rightly said, well, yeah, maybe there is some of that, but why aren't we talking about the overuse of amputation as frontline right. treatment with more than 60% of all amputations being performed without even an attempt following society guidelines to attempt to restore inline flow? And even more, and I know John Romans is going to love this, 90% of those, not even a vascular assessment in the year prior with devices like this readily available for every doctor to have inside their clinic just blows my mind. It, it, why it the is, media it is, is covering the other. It, it, it's hard not to just sort of jump on a plane and go straight to Washington, D.C. Uh, on this topic, because right. it's just <laughs> this is avoidable. Um, I, we spend a lot of our time now with uh, all the major insurance companies. Uh, I, I will say what's exciting um, from their perspective is uh, they have all embraced our technology. So we actually uh, a client base for biomedics are the insurance companies directly who then deploy technology to uh, their employed or contracted uh, physicians. And that's something that's growing. And I think that will help to continue this access or democratization um, to early studies. That's good. We, we have a we, question. Yeah. But, oh, go ahead. Oh, please. No, no, no. Please. no I, was just gonna, I was just going to say real quick, Part, of, in my opinion, part of the issue too with lack of awareness is that the patients that get peripheral arterial disease are often on the fringe of kind of society, so to speak. They're underserved or more urban, um, like statistically speaking, lower socioeconomic. There's this perception that quote they did this to themselves, they smoked or whatever. I mean, I know of physicians that won't treat patients with who have PAD because they still smoke. And, and that, like, if you have that bias going into this, 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 this specialty and this disease pathology, I, I understand why it's on, like, it's not on the radar of, you know, it's not, there's a, I have a slide listing all these f famous people that have breast cancer. Everyone knows that they had, but I say, what do all these people have in common? Well, they all have breast cancer. We, everybody knows it, but there's just no, uh, appetite, in my opinion, to to take on PAD in in like the the national spotlight or media for that matter. But well, even if, and this is what's interesting, with more than fifty percent of people in in the U.S., according to the American Diabetes Association, more than fifty percent of U.S. adults having type two diabetes, you would think that it would open up people's eyes to the conversation about PAD if if doctors would only call it PAD. ABC came out with a, a fantastic, very powerful documentary called Severed. The problem with it was it was diabetes, 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 poor circulation due to diabetes. And even the reporter told me in an interview we did, actually you and I did, John, he told mm -hmm. us that, well, we need it to be called diabetes because people care about diabetes. They don't care about PAD. And where we're finding a disconnect is when patients go online to look up diabetes and doctors are telling them you're getting your leg cut off because of diabetes. Um, they can't go online to search for potential options to treat those blocked arteries. So they settle for amputation, not knowing something else might be available. So I think we need better education to say it's poor circulation. It's known as PAD. 
and there is something we can do about it. And to sort of shine light on where there's some favorable trends, the American Diabetes Association in their most recent uh, clinical conference came out with a strong recommendation for PAD screening uh, in, in patients with diabetes. So that is uh, progress. And there's another opportunity that's here, um, especially in the Medicare space within the Medicare Advantage population. Um, there's been some criticism that chronic conditions are being identified, but not subsequently treated. And so with respect to making sure the insurance companies continue to support appropriate care with um, having minimizing prior authorizations, for instance, and uh, providing reimbursement to physicians who are treating PAD, that there is now a strong push to make sure that those people identified with PAD are receiving care. And the insurance companies need to show to CMS that they are supporting funding subsequent care for those with PAD. But even and, and even if you just look at it from a dollars and cents standpoint, if you can, I mean, I can't remember the number, but it's tens of billions of dollars that are spent on diabetic complications and the majority of those are vascular. So yeah. if you screen these patients and get them on the right medical path and lifestyle path, you're preventing and you're saving the healthcare mm -hmm. system a lot of money. It, it, this really is uh, about as strong an economic uh, mm -hmm. decision yeah. as yeah. well. So yeah. right. there, this should happen. It's interesting. Did you see um, John, either John, John squared, uh, the Dr. David Armstrong, who's a podiatrist out of Keck School of Medicine at USC in Southern California, he said that, and I can't quote the exact numbers, but he said, now we're at a point where diabetic complications that are vascular are literally costing the healthcare system more money than now all cancers combined. Yeah, um, I, I have it, some uh, material on that, that, which I can pass along and- as a podiatrist, it's interesting. There was um, Peter Sheehan, who's since passed, was a um, diabetic specialist and was early on talking about it isn't so much about blood sugar management. It is about the risks of a major cardiovascular event uh, that is what people need to be thinking about with diabetes. And in early conferences, I remember him just almost being laughed at. His father uh, believed in podiatrists, by the way, was a runner and had his uh, a foot injury that just wasn't getting fixed. And so he came across a podiatrist and really was enamored what they were able to do. And um, it was those people that introduced me candidly to podiatry. I didn't really understand what doctors of podiatric medicine, how they were, were different. But what I quickly realized is that when I go into my physical, I'm encouraged to take everything off my body except my socks. And with PAD, the first place we need to be looking at are the feet. And so podiatrists were just sort of a natural place to start in that primary care community to focus on PAD. And we have a question from Regina. Regina, do you want to go ahead and unmute and you can ask your question? Uh, yeah, I have. So I have chronic venous disease and May Therners, and I've recently had two since this year. And they've done multiple treatments on the vein issues. But they also said I have PAD, 50% blockage in my iliac. After I got the stents put in, my blood pressure, which I've always had high blood pressure, but my blood pressure went higher like two weeks after I had the stents put in and I started wearing the compression socks all the time. I've done this, you know, not wore the socks, measure my blood pressure, wore the socks, measure my blood pressure, sit down, lay down, everything. And just during the day, it still continues to be high. And they've changed my medicine, give me more medicine, one thing after another. And I still can't get the blood pressure under control. And I was curious if it could be related to the PAD in the iliac veins or iliac arteries. Dr. John? I would say highly unlikely. Um, there is some, sometimes patients can have a complication with the opening the vein and then maybe, and then potentially disrupting the artery at the same time, which then creates, um, a, a mechanism where the, the heart is working a little bit harder and the blood pressure goes up. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, May Thurner and then, uh, so two separate highways of blood travel, one south, one north. Um, and then the, the arterial blockage is unlikely to cause high blood pressure. In fact, sometimes they can cause a perceived low blood pressure because there's narrowing with, within the, um, <clears throat> within the artery where the blood pressure is being managed. Um, so, I mean, it, it may be your body just kind of readjusting to changes in, in blood flow from the stents that presumably are now helping the symptoms that you have in the leg from a venous standpoint. But, um, to my knowledge, there's, I don't think there's any link between the narrowing you have in the iliac artery and your blood pressure. Any critical questions she can ask her doctor based on what you've heard? No, I mean, I would just, again, it's the old adage, like you, you have to, when someone has peripheral arterial disease, you've got to be looking for cardiovascular issues. And, you know, so it's important to have a discussion about symptoms and um, risk factor modification. So antiplatelet use like aspirin and um, good um, measure, you know, routine evaluation of cholesterol levels and if elevated treating and, you know, making sure your blood sugar is under good control, don't smoke, things like that. It was interesting. We had a patient that presented um, to the hospital just last week in Florida who had extraordinarily high blood pressure. And the only thing that came out of the um, being admitted to the hospital was they gave her medication for to control the blood pressure and diagnosed her with PAD and actually told her that the PA, that the high blood pressure was due to undiagnosed severe PAD. Well, that that might be. In the case, if there's blockage in the kidney arteries, that yeah. can cause high blood pressure. Oh, interesting. Um, and so that technically is is PAD, but you don't get high blood pressure from the, the PAD that you and I talk about on a weekly yeah. basis in the legs. You don't get high blood pressure from that. And well, just one thought with the, with the, um, with the caller, uh, is the, the, do you have PAD and venous disease in the same leg? I was, I was thinking through on Virginia. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the PAD, though, is just in the iliac arteries. They said they said that my arteries and my legs are good. Just the veins are terrible. And they've been working on both legs and my iliac. One was 90 percent compressed in the veins. One was 80 percent and the vena cava was compressed. So the stent goes up into the vena cava and. After I got the stents, um, my a lot of the symptoms that I was having with like migraines and stuff, a lot of that went away. And but my legs still are not great. Um, really, not much improvement at all. It, and the other thing is the blood pressure. And they've they've done the renal artery um, ultrasound. It looked fine. Uh, they sent me to the cardiologist. They've done a bunch of tests there. All those looked good, they said, and nobody has an answer for it. But it just spiked like this after I got the uh, stents put in. And they did make sure that the blood was flowing good through the stents like six weeks later, and those were still good. Yeah, I, I would just say um, it's extremely rare for patients to have narrowing in both veins um, and the IVC. So I'm a little... Uh, uh, this is again my opinion, so it's not worth um, that. You know, you can get a cup of coffee, and that's about it with it. But um, it, it's extremely rare to have blood narrowing in both veins. So I would that I'd question that diagnosis. But either way, it's what's done is done. Um, the other issue is sometimes patients just have resistant hypertension that all of a sudden it just happens. Yeah. Um, the nice thing about that there are um, uh, treatment options out there called renal denervation to help certain patients, pretty specific patient population. But, you know, that's something that uh, potentially you could just discuss with your physician should your blood pressure not uh, be able to be controlled over the next, you know, few months or so with changes in medications. And Regina, I owe you an email. It's always good when you text me to let me know you send an email. Um, I'm so sorry that it's taking me so long to get back to you, but uh, we'll follow up, okay, um, today with you on that. Are there any other questions for John Squared um, before? I don't want to keep them all day. I have uh, but a quick one. Douglas, sure. 
what well, I was it, this sounds very exciting and I was wondering where do you see it going from here and the possibilities of change in making a difference in saving lives and limbs and uh, making a difference between the hospitals primary care the little shops everybody where uh, and it just sounds so exciting I was wondering where you thought we'd go from here. Well, on the technology side, I, I can tell you what what is inspiring me today is that you are taking the time to participate in a conversation like this uh, that, that Kim is leading. So I think that the work in, in engaging with, with patients is, uh, in the end, going to be what's most exciting. We're working very hard to make this kind of technology to better understand this disease early in the primary care setting, but ultimately finding a way where we can do this in the home and work with patients directly so that you can advocate for um, the best care by being informed is, uh, is what I think would be most exciting. We already have people that actually are buying the pulse oximeters for the fingers and using mm -hmm. it on their toes. And while John, Dr. John over here, has talked about it, I think, in our early days of the show, where it's okay to do that. It's not necessarily, it's not accurate, but if you do it every day and you have a consistent number, if that number changes, um, it could indicate something. But it sounds as though, which I'm excited about, that there could be something, that, and I think there should be something, such as we have a thermometer, right? We have blood pressure cups for our arms. How easy would it be for the patient to then actually learn how to put that blood pressure cuff on their legs as well and be able to do it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that uh, the only, in, in my mind, the only rationale for doing that would be in someone who's had a procedure um, and monitoring the durability of that procedure because sometimes we, lo we lose patients who um uh you know they they get the procedure done they feel great and then we never see them again until like three years later when the arteries narrowed and so that i think is a very value added thing i have patients that check their blood pressure three times a day they they can do that that's great it does not help me clinically one bit and we get abis on patients once a year um and it's, it's the same thing like, you know, so from a cardiology standpoint, if someone had had a heart attack in the past or a stent 15, 20 years ago, they got a yearly stress test. We don't do that anymore. It's not cost effective. And patients have to tell us if their symptoms are back and then that prompts us. And so, yes, if there's a clinical change, I think it would be value added. Um, but until then, it's unless if it's just, you know, free, it's free to the patient and they can, you know, do it on their Apple Watch or something there. That might be a benefit, but routine ABIs, um, probably unlikely. John. Oh, on, I think here, community based collaboration is key. Uh, I think we've talked about screening programs that don't have connection to information or care really just sort of creates dead ends. Uh, so to the extent that uh, we're talking about having technology sort of used in the home by patients in a independent capacity, I think it has real shortcomings along the lines of what uh, Dr. Phillips is just saying. Uh, to the extent, though, that we can get to the patients sooner, our, we're working with through primary care and podiatric physicians to make that happen today. Um, that is, and there's a lot of work to do. So we aren't, aren't, we're not in a position to take our eye off the ball until we feel like we have reached all the markets. And as your callers have mentioned, that includes the rural communities where in many cases, this care is, is more desperately needed than, uh, than in many major metropolitan areas. Um, and as long as we're keeping those that have the knowledge, because care protocols will continue to change. As Dr. Phillips just mentioned, what was done uh, just recently is no longer the same protocol. So we'll always want to make sure that we have the specialists collaborating with people of access uh, to patients and that, and then obviously the patients as well. And we have Marsha again on our YouTube channel um, saying that Levy County, Florida, L-E-V-Y County, Florida. So she hopes to see your device at a clinic there so that she can have access to it. And what's interesting about this partnership and one of our goals right, is I, I mentioned once during this program 
but it's worth mentioning again, is to inspire other primary care physicians to adopt a technology. It may not be yours, but you know what? It, it is a great technology. You are in what, more than 1,200 sites across the U.S., um, you're well respected, you know, with the technology. You said you've had more than a million readings, um, you know, across the U.S. at these clinics. Um, but we want to get more and more primary care. I don't know what it is, and maybe Dr. John could uh, touch on this. I don't understand why we've had such a hard time in the vascular community shaking up the primary care industry to it's, to do this and i know that they're already overworked they have a lot on their plate there's a lot going on but everyone has a lot going on right now and no, i yeah. tried to get to um to to talk to um the primary care societies there there are multiple ones and i it's crickets and but i find that i'm not the only one and i don't understand why but yet here comes biomedics and they're infiltrating they're going one by one by one and literally saying, hey, just put this in your clinic and they're succeeding. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got uh, to run to run event here, um, but I want to say one last thing. Um, I think it's it's because they just have way too much on their plate already. What Where I would, I, in my opinion, and I, I'm not an expert on this, but I think there's a, there's a lot of nurse practitioners out there that I think um, are a little bit more willing to maybe spend the time with the patient and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, maybe dive into some of these um, uh, um, kind of diseases that are often maybe overlooked. And so I think getting, in, getting into nurse practitioner run clinics, um, obviously under supervis supervision of a physician, that's probably a nice little sweet spot um, as well, that because let's be line. honest, we're not the physician. There's going to be a, a major physician shortage. There's already like uh, to get an MA. I mean, it's almost impossible to hire an MA to, to do that. I mean, it's just like there's a crisis here, a, a person power crisis. And so I think that's probably why you're running into some of these roadblocks. But um, And before you go, and then uh, John Romans, we have just a couple more questions for you. We have a special okay. treat actually for Dr. John. So I want to turn the, um, the attention to Sunshine. Sunshine, you have a special treat for Dr. John. Give her a second. What? You have a special treat for Dr. John. You want to show him? <laughs> I think you Sorry, skipped it. Sorry, audio off. No, yes. it, it froze up. Like it froze <laughs> up. I, and it, like you said, you said something like a short sentence. You started talking and then it just nothing. froze. And then so, you were like, you want to show him? And I'm like, I don't even know who you're talking to right now. <laughs> <laughs> so sunshine. Hi, you sunshine. How are you? Week? I'm I, good. How are you? I'm well, I saw, I saw your video. Kudos. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Hold on. I'll show you again. Oh, good. <laughs> Fantastic. This is such an amazing moment. She has been working so hard. I am incredibly proud of her. Look at this. Can you see? I can see. That's amazing because upwards of probably 40% of people who have a major amputation never walk again. So, Awesome. Kudos. Thank you. Sunshine, nice it job. You, it hey. did, but you kept on going and you're persevering. Just like yeah. our quote for the day, right? Don't put off, you know, what you can do today till tomorrow. So good job. Well done. Thank you. And thank you for sharing. Two more questions. And thank you, Dr. John. You guys. Regina, Cheers. You have one. Regina, you have one more and then we'll get to Vlad. Yeah, I was just wondering about the PAD in your arms. How do they know if that's what you have? Is it still just based off of ultrasound or blood pressure readings? Or because before I had the stents, my arms and legs and feet were going numb. Now just my arms are going numb. Interesting. Does your test account for that, John? Sure. So we'll take blood pressures in the arms. And uh, there's other studies... Um, it's called pulse volume recording. 
And that's where we use cuffs and uh, they inflate to a pressure that is sensitive enough to uh, monitor the swelling and contracting of your arms each time your heart beats. So we can look to see if there's any complications there. Um, but usually, uh, and, and I, I am not a physician, but most often the reason we use the arms as references is because it is um, much less frequent that there is blockage in the arms versus blockage in the legs. But if you're experiencing, you said numbness, are yes. your are, are your hands, uh, do you have um, skin discoloration or have you had any unusual hair loss in your arms? Uh, have you had a, a cut on your arm that has a hard time healing? Uh, as far as all that, no, but the numbness and tingling is quite often still. Sure. And you it, it, have you been assessed at all for peripheral neuropathy? Oh, uh, like what kind of testing? Because they didn't really do any testing that said that. They ha were before all this, it took them four years to figure this out because I guess of my age, no one sent me to get tested for this. So um, they and were treating have... me for neuropathy and giving me gabapentin. Okay. And do you have diabetes? No. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, in, in, in offline, um, and this is part of what we're excited to do, is to uh, learn about where you are and uh, provide some some guidance on physicians that uh, have a particular interest in in this area so that they could more closely evaluate evaluate you. And very soon it'll be on padtest.org. We're going to get that all squared away one by one. Those are, names are going to be going up next week as well. So everyone's exactly. going to have access to the sites that have um, the PadNet device, um, which I, you know, what I love about it is just that it has the ABI, it has the PVR with the ultrasound, and it also has the TBI, which, you know, the TBI, I think, is so important for diabetics. And I think it's under, under um, you know, valued, you know, in terms of its, you know, um, because it, I think it's really important. With a general ABI, we get a lot of false normals, especially in those patients that have the heart, really hardened arteries that are non-compressible. Um, for example, a lot of diabetics in advanced stages. And so what I like is that you're covering all bases with your technology, um, which I think is really good. Um, we're going to need you to be speaking in front of them because that was, you just nailed it. <laughs> well, I believe in it. I, I believe in what you, what you guys are doing, anything that we can do to, to get, you know, on the front lines, um, and get in front of these patients, I think is really key. And Vlad, you have one more question for, um, for John Roman, CEO of Biomedics. You have to go ahead and unmute. Maybe I can help you here. Joey. So. Go ahead and unmute, Vlad. Oh, can you hear me now? We, we can, can hear you. Thank you for joining us um, from Thank Vancouver. Yes. I uh, recently started to experience uh, light uh, heart pain, which is comes and go, and also cramps in my legs and different parts of my legs, which is also comes and goes. And I was sent to to arterial duplex low extremity bilateral test. And I just want to ask, first of all, which test for PAD more accurate, arterial, arterial duplex lower extremity bilateral or, or ankle brachial index test? Which, which test most accurate? So it's an, it's an interesting question, and they're both important, and I'll, I'll uh, explain briefly why. Um, uh, the technology that uses in PadNet is referred to as physiologic technology. And so we are monitoring the change of volume of things, whether it's of your uh, legs expanding and contracting or looking at uh, the volume of blood that's flowing down um, either your arteries or your veins versus duplex ultrasound is imaging. And, and so that imaging, it's, it's looking uh, directly at that, uh, that blood flow. What, so what's nice about imaging is you could see it and, and can pick up plaque, uh, which sort of builds up on our teeth and could be building up in your arteries and compromising blood flow down your legs. 
what is um, a, a limiting factor of duplex ultrasound is its ability to sort of understand what they, ref they refer to as the, the hemodynamic significance. So the actual impact on blood flow. And so the, the combination is, um, is great. Uh, but if, if I, I would say that duplex ultrasound, if, if you've already have that, um, uh, that's very good technology, often uh, um, reserved for vascular labs. And so I think that it sounds like, and did you have questions about your finding or do you feel like that was good feedback on the post test? I, I'm, uh, I'm concerned it's how we did it because when we started doing arterial duplex low extremity bilateral on me, mm -hmm. uh, the second tech joined them and start doing ankle brachial index at the same time. And that's what worries me in terms of quality. In other words, if one test can, if we do it in the same time, affect another. Should okay. we do it one, one after another? That's my question. So, good question. Um, for the ABI test uh, that you had, ideally it is done um, with after several minutes of rest, five, 10 minutes of, of resting. So that's of you not moving around ideally lying down flat or supine, and that way your legs are at the same level as your heart. Yes, uh, and we, did not, the... yeah, we did not do that. And can that okay. affect arterial duplex low extremity bilateral result? Yeah. It can? It, it, uh, if you're moving around, um, it, it, movement uh, or not being at rest can impact the results of the ABI test. But of of the of the scan, about, uh, what about arterial duplex low extremity bilateral? Can it impact that result of that test of of second test? Um, possibly it, it depends. I would really, I mean, that's a question that I would defer to Dr. Phillips. Um, uh, but maybe that's something that we can follow up on. So, can I ask Dr. Phillips about that? Yeah, he's not he's not here. But I think oh. that Vlad brings up a really uh, important point, John, and and this is where I think that your technology helps. Um, Vlad, how there is a big gap right between the time that you started experiencing these symptoms and you have the test what weeks later, and then you have to wait even more weeks to get another appointment with your primary care to get the results. And then that doesn't even include the time between getting the referral and then making an appointment. How does that affect your, your mindset? You've been scared. I mean, you've been calling me and you've been telling me that it's scary not knowing because of this big time delay from the moment you're experiencing symptoms to still what, more than a month later with no answers? Well, uh, I wait for the, the angiogram of my heart right now to do, but I did this arterial duplex low extremity bilateral with ABI, but the problem is we did this both tests together with not let me rest, which is required for ABI, you say correctly. So, so I cannot trust the result of both tests based on that, correct? I what I'm asking, no, uh, I, I think a lot of them do those tests together. And even this PadNet technology um, combines, it, it It performs the ABI, it performs an ultrasound, and it performs even the toe brachial index, all with one set of devices. And they, they're performed at the same time. And so it, it might be done. We just need to understand more in your case. And we can't make the assessment for you without having been there in the room and having seen the results. But my question to you, Vlad, is, and, and your, your concerns that you're expressing right now actually speaks volumes and almost answers my question. And, yeah. and maybe it's just rhetorical now that it's scary, right? The, you have to wait this long and there's this time delay um, between the moment you feel the symptoms to the time you finally get to the test to the fi finally the time you actually get to discuss the test and the results with a primary care physician. So you're left right now, Vlad, and you're scared. You have no answers. Well, I just want uh, 
I won't repeat that test because I won't repeat that test one after another. So it's not would be in the same time for accuracy. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I, I, I would, that's how you feel. I would share that with your physician. Um, yes. And, and our job is to make sure that the physicians that you're seeing in a primary care setting have access to the type of technology you need to give you a better understanding on uh, the health of your arteries. Yes. But, but, I but, think... but IBI, IBI also important to do. If my arteries show okay, IBI still needed. If I experience that symptoms, the light. I think the next better. step would probably be an ultrasound. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Vlad. And I think that John, and it, it further just, um, I know he wasn't addressing, but just it, you can see, um, you know, the fear, the anxiety that this causes with the waiting game and with having your device or having a testing device on the front lines with the primary care, with podiatry, where the patient can have, there's no delay between um, mm -hmm. the point where they're expressing, they're presenting with their symptoms and actually getting the test, which could be weeks out. And then it's weeks out again to get the results and have those results discussed. Can you just address how your technology and having it on the front lines as it is actually reduces the gap and mitigates that fear, that anxiety that these patients are expressing? Sure, I'll give you a real life example. We had a podiatric physician in the Washington DC market he had a long-standing patient who was a dentist um, and did a PadNet study on the patient. It was interpreted remotely by a vascular specialist in the community. Mm -hmm. It was going into winter holidays, and the specialist immediately called the podiatrist and said, um, I am very concerned about these results, and I would like to uh, see this patient right away. Now, this I know the specialist is usually booked for four weeks, so usually a month out. Uh, but cleared his evening so that it, he could see this patient and was able to do uh, perform um, a revascularization procedure wow. that he was positive, certainly saved the foot and wow. possibly uh, the limb. What's What I was so curious about, because a couple of things, the patient had been seeing this podiatrist for some time, and I was a little concerned that the patient might be upset with the podiatrist. But it was the exact opposite. The fact that the podiatrist was able to collaborate with a specialist and make a priority of his patient to see the specialist and, mm -hmm. and have a successful procedure done, the patient was so um, overwhelmed with gratitude to the podiatrist because he enabled uh, this kind of access. And it was the right decision to move this patient, not from the back of the line to wait four weeks, but to go straight to the front of the line. That's really exciting. I think that's the power of these community-based collaborations. I love that. I, I think that that's absolutely amazing. I love that you even have that, that personal story, you know, and that it still inspires you and that it's right there at the tip of your tongue. Um, I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, before you go again, yes. one more thing. Um, I, I wanted to see if anyone would be willing to share their journey to diagnosis and the struggles that you had, more than 70% of people who were polled in our groups um, said that upon presenting with the textbook pad symptoms, they were actually offered a different diagnosis. And I'm curious if anyone wants to share um, that story that will further um, prove that this testing as frontline is really critical. Anyone have any of those stories here? I think most of the folks that I see here have all been diagnosed actually way too late. They presented in later stages um, versus mine earlier was, stages. Mine, they said, was a pinched nerve in my back. Oh, wow. How long between that time and what other treatments were you offered for that pinched nerve that never actually brought you any sort of relief that for like two years they gave me uh naproxen and cholesterol oh, wow. and it wasn't until i went to the er and a cardiologist put the dye in 
that they found it. And by that time, when they got me in the OR, they said I was literally hours away from dying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that, that was identified. Um, I, I have my personal story is actually through um, one of my parents who was complaining of what he thought was lower back problems, actually was you know, misdiagnosed to the point where had a lower back surgery done um, and was just not recovering and was advised that just needed to take time for that to heal. Uh, now, obviously I'm biased and uh, one might argue, I think everyone has PAD, but I took uh, the device to my family and I did the study and uh, saw compromised blood flow in the wow. legs, was sent to a uh, vascular specialist. And the symptoms that he was describing as lower back were really upper buttock discomfort. And so uh, had a, a piggyback stents done, so two stents placed in, and was walking and playing golf a week later. And that is those time, those straight true story. That's amazing. But that was after you already started the company. It was after I started the company, but it's when I knew, I, I will say that originally, like many, that I thought that the people that needed our t equipment would be the Dr. Phillips of the world. And that uh, we need to go places like the Mayo Clinic and to Cleveland Clinic and to Mass General. And it took, um, it actually took conversations with the specialists who explained to us uh the two typical problems one either that they uh too many people are referring patients that don't have vascular admissions to them and it's just that takes time to navigate or that they're not seeing them soon enough because the primary care uh, community um, is not aware of the disease or doesn't think they should be doing it or they don't know what to do with the results and so uh, I had been in telecom and technology had advanced to the point now where I knew I could securely um, take the information from the device and make it remotely available to a specialist. And that's where we really leaned into the community-based collaboration approach. Oh, that's amazing. We always, I mean, there's always that, that personal touch that really drives it and keeps you going, right? Every single day that that's why you wake up every single day. We say we live vicariously through our customers and every single employee of biomedics feels that way. Amazing. I can tell. I mean, when I work with with both Chris and Adara, their passion is is amazing. And one of the other things that I think is really great about our collaboration is, um, and I wish more companies would do it, companies get emails from patients all the time um, asking them questions about PAD and, it, and it's a really, because, you know, you guys have a really good opportunity and, you know, more money than we do at the Global PAT Association. We're a 501c3. And so it's nice that um, I love our partnership also in that uh, those patients that do present to your website um, with issues and need questions answered, um, Adara sends them to me and we're able to track all of those that come through your website and we're able to help. And we're able to facilitate getting them, you know, life and limb saving care, or at least find them the answers that they need in real time so that they're not, um, you know, racking their brain and, and you know, relying upon Dr. Google, which is so reliable. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and we feel the exact same way. I mean, we really are excited about uh, the care that can be accelerated and delivered more cost effectively, more timely uh, through this collaboration. Thank you so much for all of your time. I'm really ex excited going forward and we're going to have, make sure you visit padtest.org and it's going to be continuing to get populated with more and more doctors as we go over the coming weeks. But really yeah. excited. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, John, for, for supporting us and supporting this initiative and, and this partnership. Oh, thank you for all you do. Awesome. And I'm yeah, gonna open it can up I ask him a oh. Can I ask him a question? Of course, Marsha, go sure. ahead. I, I, before he leaves, um, I was curious, maybe this, my idea is too simplistic, but isn't an ABI test basically um, taking your blood pressure in your arm and then in your lower extremity? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Well, then why, I, I'm curious why you have to go to labs like 
why can't they do it right in the doctor's office? Just with the simple blood pressure cuff. That's a good question. It is a great question. Um, And unfortunately, the arteries, so the blood flow in your arm, it, it can be um, it can be assessed easily with, with the de- blood pressure device that you're talking about in the arm, but right. doing that same calculation, uh, in your ankle or down at the toe is, is much more challenging, um, just because of the physical structure of things. And so we're not able to use that same cuff technology at the ankle that is used most commonly in the arm. Uh, so oh. that's why that's why that that specific technology is not able to do that. But your point about why can't I have this test done in the primary care setting is is heard loud and clear uh, uh, for me. And we agree with you. And that's what we are working to do to make that technology readily available in the primary care setting so that you can have it done just like you have that regular blood pressure uh, done. Thank you. So then my at-home experiment with my blood pressure cuff was completely a fail. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, it probably is. I, I, I think it would be, um, I would not rely on the results of that. That would be hard. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Great Thank question. Thank you so much, John. I'm going to open it up actually to everyone just to share their journeys to diagnosis because I know everyone has a very different journey and it'd be interesting to hear um, your journey to diagnosis, because I know even for Douglas, it, Douglas had multiple procedures before he even learned he had PAD, and um, which I thought was interesting. So um, thank you, John. You're welcome to stick around and listen in. Um, but we're going to start opening up to others to to just share their journeys to diagnosis. I just have for one more add to my question, if I can. Okay, sure. Vlad. Uh, so if I did this both tests together and my arterial duplex low extremity bilateral show no evidence success of significant arterial disease as a result, but since it was done parallel with ankle brachial index, can I trust that or not? That's my question. Oh, I, I, unfortunately... Um... I, I, do, I do hear your question, and I and I understand um, that it it's a straightforward question to ask. Yes. Um, the the answer, unfortunately, is not straightforward. Um, not being your uh, your your doctor or the person that um, did the test, because there are a lot of factors that can come into play. Um, believe it or not, things like room temperature, body position, movement. Uh, stress level, uh, we've talked about um, if you'd had caffeine or nicotine, there's, there's a lot of things. So um, what I would encourage you to do is to take those results back to your um, your physician and have them walk you through those results for you so that you can feel comfortable uh, in, I'm, I'm assuming that they've they've sent those to you. So they're saying these are the results and they're satisfied with them. Uh, but asking them to walk through those results with you so that you can be more comfortable and decide what to do next. I don't think Vlad's even gotten the results. Have you to Vlad? I, you I, haven't sent them to I, me. I got the results, but see, one technician was holding one my my right leg to do arterial duplex, lower extremity bilateral, and same time another technician was placing cuff to, pr- to pressure right. cuff on ankle brachial index. So my question is, how ankle brachial index affect the result for arterial? It can affect the result so, for arterial duplex low extremity bilateral if we do it same time or not. So That's what's I question. think that he's answered your question, but I think that it's a question he's saying is is more appropriate for your discussion with your primary care. Uh, if you have gotten the results, we're happy to also have a doctor um, just review them to, and we we also in our network we have. And even on our website at padtest.org, you can look at the um, the standard sheet for results and see how doctors actually view those results. And you can go ahead and, and compare your results to the standard on there. When is your appointment? I think you said it's coming up next week with your primary care. Well, that's for my heart study. That's for my angiogram for my okay, heart. Okay, where is when is your primary care physician meeting with you about your results? Is that coming up? 
Do you no, have an the, for that? the cardiologist only meet me two months later. The okay, then thing. that's something that you and I are going to work on offline. Part of what we do with the Global PAD Association is is we meet with with people offline and we help them to make sure that they do get uh, an appointment scheduled with their primary care so that they can get those results read. And Vlad, we're going to work on that offline. So um, we'll take care of that later. But again, John, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you and all of your time. Um, and enjoy the lacrosse game. <laughs> Thank you so you'll much. Get some it's, in. <laughs> it, it, it's perfect timing. Uh, the next game is at the top of the hour. So I appreciate the time together. Uh, all the callers times really fascinating conversation. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. And I'll yes, open bye -bye. it up now to Doug. Let's go ahead and your journey to diagnosis. And we'll start with you. Well, I, I have a question for Vaya. You know, we're all here for you, buddy, right? And how are, how are you doing with the up and down and the daily, the insanity of what we all go through? How are you doing with that? Uh, you ask me? Yeah. Well, I, I it's relatively new for me that symptoms, what I experience. So I understand it can be very serious disease if it is, but the problem is I don't know I don't know how severity that is in my situation because what I experience it's light heart pain uh, which is comes and go and cramps in my legs which is also comes and goes. Uh, not every time, but besides test uh, that test which is was I did arterial duplex low extremity test but it was done together with why not let me relax for ankle brachial index. So it was not accurate. So I don't, I need to repeat that to get more accurate, you know, reading. And uh, so I don't know what else to do, basically. You know what I mean? Because what's important is to, to cough that disease earlier to start treatment, right? But uh, besides test, I don't know what else to do. Just wanted you to know that we're all here for you, okay? Okay, thank you. And it, it, it's that story that we go through. I mean, I had, I saw my primary care doctor three days after I fell in the yard and I couldn't walk. And I mean, it was two years and about four months later when I was officially diagnosed with TAD, but I had stents an arterial bifemoral bypass and an XL bifemoral bypass. So I had gone through all this stuff and kept going through and kept getting, I well, said from I... one doctor to another doctor to another doctor before I was officially diagnosed. And it was only after I met Kim in the group <laughs> that I, I was actually able to get to a doctor who was able to, who actually said, Mr. Salisbury, do you know you have PAD? He was like, no, I never heard of it. But this was after I had everything else. And I and my vascular surgeon who did both surgeries so never, I even want... mentioned, never even mentioned PAD, never told me to stop. I was smoking off and on. Yeah, I wasn't eating right. I was trying to eat healthy as I could, but I wasn't eating right. And but I was working and still doing all the stuff that I was doing, but I just kept having more problems and more problems. And it was only after I met Kim and they got me hooked up with Dr. Walker out of Homa, Louisiana, was I officially diagnosed. But that was two and a half years later after I had all these other procedures done. And that's part of that insanity. I mean, how many of us in the group? We weren't diagnosed right off the bat. We've been through all the things that we've been through years later before we actually got diagnosed and got to the right doctors. I yeah, mean, my, Dr. Walker was not in a hospital. He was associated with a hospital in Homa, Louisiana, but he was he had his own place. And I I, mean, I, I came this meeting a little. Uh, I came to this meeting today a little late, so. What 
you was talking earlier, it's some type of new device would help diagnose that, right? Some type of new device. Unmute. Thank you. Oh. It's a new device. It's called PadNet, P-A-D-N-E-T, and it combines the ABI, the ultrasound, and the TBI. So when you express concern about the, the ABI and the ultrasound being done together, I actually see it, it being done quite often. And in fact, with this particular device, it offers the ability for a doctor to perform an ABI, an ultrasound, and a TBI, where they place the, the cuff on the, on the toe, um, all at the same time and be able to get um, a, a lot more information that a doctor may use to give you a more accurate diagnosis. What happens a lot is frontline, a patient is offered just the ABI, um, that ankle brachial index where they, um, where they place the blood pressure cuffs on the arms and the legs, and then they compare the two to see if, if um, there, there's a difference in, in pressures. Um, what you don't want is low pressure in your legs. And, and that's really critical. And that's what they're trying to discover. That low pressure in your legs could be due to lack of blood flow, some potential blockages in your arteries in your legs. And, and that is concerning. That's what we call peripheral artery disease. And that could be because of, uh, you know, really hard calcium. It could be caused, you know, by chronic clot, fresh clot, whatever it might be. Okay, so there they can actually um, combine these these different te tests into into one as PadNet has done. And if you want to learn more, you can go to Biomedics B I O M E D I X dot com, and I can go ahead and put this in the um, in the thread here, and maybe Joshua can put it in the YouTube thread as well, our producer for the YouTube clips, um, just if you want to learn more about that particular technology as well. Go ahead, Douglas. So let, let me ask this. As, as you're talking about that, does my first thought was my primary physician at one point actually took my shoe off, but he never attached anything. He didn't put a he didn't check my blood pressure. He, he just took my shoe off and sock off and took two fingers uh -huh. and did the two finger thing. So with these new devices, it, are we trying, I mean, how do we, it, so I guess it's up to the primary care doctors to get out there and learn this new and how do we get those primary, like the primary doctor I have here, he was the first one who ever took my shoe off after all the other doctors I've been to and how many, we hear that all the time, don't we? And how, when's the last time you've been to a doctor and they didn't actually touch you, you know? So at what point do, so I, I, does that, does that make sense? So do they go together? Is there one before the other one or is, is that what we're trying to help fix? I think, I mean, step one is to even get, the doctor to touch your feet. I mean, that's, that's definitely step one. That's a really good point, Douglas, that I think that that is up to the patients. Now, if the doctor does not have you take off your socks, you take off your socks and say, Hey doc, check my feet, touch my feet. And we have that acronym chat, C H A T, you know, check my carotids, even take your fingers, check, take your stethoscope, check my carotids, my carotid arteries that feed your brain. <laughs> you really want those checked often. Um, check my heart, check for AFib, check for atrial flutter, check um, you know, to see if there's any valvular issues. Um, there is a new stethoscope, ECHO, A-E-K-O, -E that actually um, makes it easier for doctors to even check for valvular issues in your hearts. Check your abdomen, A stands for abdomen, check for an aneurysm. In your abdomen, you say, hey, doc, check for a brewy. It's spelled brute, B-R-U-I-T. Check for a brewy. And what that means is check for that turbulent flow in my abdomen. And that's the same thing what they're looking for here in your in your carotids as well. Check for that turbulent flow or that brewy. I mean, and then check your toes. T stands for toes, right? Um, make sure, touch touch those pulses. See if there's there's low blood pressure. See if you can feel anything. 
Many people in our group say, hey, my doctor couldn't feel much. And so they sent me for a, a, an advanced vascular assessment because of that. So even just the touch can tell you so much. So most Maybe primary doctors right. should be able to take two fingers and know how to do that. Right. Right. Two fingers, Douglas. two seconds could save life and limb. Douglas. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I think that this is a great idea for this. Um, what did you call it, Kim? The, I Padnet. forget what you call it. P -A -D -N -E -T. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think it's a great idea, but um, where I live, it's all big health networks and they not the primary care physician, but the networks determined so much. And I can't see them, at least not the health network, paying for these machines. I just can't see it. It's all about the bottom dollar. And it would cost, I mean, even though these machines aren't that expensive compared to going to a lab, I can't see them spending the money to do it unless the physicians themselves can buy it. Well, the good news is that they have infiltrated the market, more than 1,200 across the country, um, dietary clinics, vascular clinics, um, primary care clinics. And I think that there are more and more of them, especially in more rural communities. And I think that that's right. where we're seeing the highest populations of PAD patients, um, especially ones that are a toe step away from amputation that are getting diagnosed way too late. In many of these areas, they have shortages of primary care physicians, of vascular specialists, of podiatrists. They're few and far between. And we have many of these clinics that just have nurse practitioners. And I think Douglas would tell you, you know, there are a lot of areas in Texas in particular where all we do is work with nurse practitioners in small clinics. And physicians are starting a chain of these clinics that are spread out across these rural communities um, where the, the physician is the supervise, they're a supervising physician for these nurse practitioners, maybe four or five of them. And, you know, across, let's say, um, a, you know, an area that's, you know, pretty large, maybe hundreds of miles. And having these devices in those clinics are, you know, imperative to get people diagnosed sooner rather than later. I think you're right. And some of the areas that, you know, are densely, you know, that have a lot of these healthcare systems, you have universities, you have large facilities and such. Um, it might not be the right market because there are a lot of options for patients to get tested. But even what uh, John Romans, the CEO of Biomedics, was saying, that in some of these communities the pa where the patients are struggling to navigate the system, um, some of the primary care physicians or podiatrists that have their own office that is not necessarily attached, they're within that health network, but they're not necessarily attached. They might be a few miles away they're the ones that are saying, hey, you know what, we can make a decision to put this in our clinic and just one patient a week that they perform the test on will make it worth their while in order to pay for the monthly um, subscription to this device. See, that's, that's the thing. My primary physician, my primary vascular surgeon here in Beaumont had six different locations. I was, for about a year, I was with him. I never actually saw him in person. It was always his nurse practitioner. Mm. I never actually saw him. Not one time. It was always her. And she would say, I'm going to tell him, or he told me to tell you this. Because he was either in San Antonio or El Paso or Austin on that day. But in, in the one I see now, he has three locations. And you see him at each location. So he goes from one. So yep. I see him in Seguin. He is, I have not seen his nurse practitioners in the room, but he's always been there. When he goes to Corpus Christi, every patient sees him. When he goes into Austin, which is another hour up the road from where he is now, he sees those patients, but his nurse practitioner is always in there. But the guy here in Beaumont, yeah, I, I never, I didn't see him for a year. I knew his name. I didn't know what he looked like, but I knew his nurse practitioner. So it was like, that's the crazy part in it. And mm -hmm. we talk about this. How many times, I mean, the last doctor visit 
I had before I got this one, I don't think the guy ever touched me in six months. I don't think he ever touched any part of my body, even with the stethoscope. He, he could at least walked over and checked my check just to make sure, check my, you know, my breath. Well, are you still breathing? Yeah. But he never touched me. So how many times do we hear about that? Where yeah. he's never actually touched that person. That's a question right there. If doctors aren't touching their patients, you know, why would they even use a machine like this? They're not even bothering to, to touch people. I mean, that's absurd to think. They never touched my mom two weeks before she died. If they would have literally just touched my mom's um, belly, they would have discovered some serious turbulent flow due to her aneurysm dissecting. It's that like, I, so I walk into, the, I have an earache and he bops, he bop, he said, put your knee up here and he bops my leg and my leg goes, he said, all right, you're okay. He's like, uh, hello, I have an earache. What are we talking about? You know, <laughs> I was in the hospital. Remember, I was in the hospital that time and the one doctor walked in. He said, I had to look your condition up. And my first thought was, is what well, gave you, you confidence right out at that door, you know, because it's like, if you had to look it up, I'm in trouble. Well, I guess I have to give it to my my vascular surgeons locally here. They're retiring and Kim's been uh, fighting to help me new, find new care. But they always have their hands on me, checking different pulses, even the bypasses to the two finger test. Um, they were always hands on. And so is e even my, uh, the uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon that I see, he's very hands-on. Um, so I guess it's a different, maybe a different thought here. I don't know. And I think Kim, Marcia, we'll get to you, but I think Kim really addressed that. How often do you see that with everything you go through? How many different doctors out there that actually take that time or that don't take that time? And you probably see that more with dealing with all of us as much as you do. And how many times have you heard doctors say, well, ain't nothing I can do for you. See you later. And oh my gosh. Did. I hear that all the time. Mm. You know? And, you know, to, to their credit, so many, these doctors are so busy, but by the same token, if they would take a moment and just stop and just listen. Um, and that's why I always tell people it's really good if I'm in the room, right? How, how much of a difference does it make, Douglas or even Marsha, that you've had me on the phone with you? Do, do you think it makes a difference having that extra advocate in there to help fight for you, to help get that doctor to just stop for a second and listen and be more engaged? Well, it absolutely you... helps. It absolutely helps. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you. A happy story. I'm fortunate enough to live close to a pretty good medical hub near Gainesville, Florida. That said, it's still like 45 minutes away. And I, you know, living alone, I have to schedule the logistics of people taking me to a procedure and then bringing me home because you can't drive. But I'll tell you something. PAD is very much a multidisciplinary issue it's a teamwork approach and um it goes from the x-ray techs that do the ultrasounds to the nurse practitioners and pas that uh take the the information that sometimes hand on to the the doctor the surgeon because he's busy at another location and the patient, a good patient, will understand this process, especially in this day and age of, oh, man, 15-minute appointments for my primary, you know, and the primary is like rushing you, or, or some primaries do. Mine don't. But that said, uh, the multidisciplinary approach really begins with the patient themselves, and that's where education and sharing your story is so important. My story, mm -hmm. quick and short and simple, is that uh, I'm in a Facebook group for PAD. That's how I ran across Doug and Kim. And I 
And I found out about this group through actually uh, being very involved with dementia adv advocacy, which is another story. But anyway, I posted in there that um, I needed a, I, I went and saw a vascular surgeon and he did this procedure and I woke up and he told me, well, we couldn't get access. And so your choices are to live with the pain or have an above knee amputation. Wow. And I'm like, well, I'll get back to you on that. Fortunately, I do have a medical background. I worked in the ER as an x-ray tech. And so I do know how to ask the questions. Um, and when I told this story in the group, Kim actually came in the post like right away and said, stop, get a second opinion. Where do you live? And I told her and she said, go see Dr. Arthur Lee. And so I looked him up, did some research and uh, reached out through my insurance and got it approved. And do you know what? This was Christmas time. I didn't even meet the man until like 10 minutes before the procedure. He came in and I said, thank you, doctor, so much for taking me as a patient three days after Christmas. And um I follow up with him. I have more stent placements to go. I'm slowly turning into the bionic woman. But that said, I'd much rather be a bionic woman, still walking, still living, having quality of life than having an above knee amputation. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So before you met us on the group, before you met us, in all the appointments you've been to, we, we I hear this a lot, is... And this goes for me, too. I didn't know the questions to ask. I wasn't aware to ask this or ask that back in the very beginning. And if I had known those things in the very beginning, would it have made a difference where what I went through? Absolutely. Because I would have said, hey, time out. Hold on. Let's take a break, you know, before we do this. So and I think we run into that a lot here. How many of us in the beginning are are? We just trust the doctors and we go along with it. Or we just don't know all the questions are the right questions to ask. You hit the nail on the head right there. Actually, um, I kind of self-diagnosed myself, you know, having enough of a medical background to be dangerous, but having enough common sense not to fall down the, oh, my God, I'm dying of every disease Google tells me. Um if I had had information available to me about, you know, do you get tired just walking to the mailbox and back? Don't wait. Go get checked. It would have saved me four years of time and pain and agony, chronic pain at a level five. That's my daily. Uh, that's what I live with on a daily basis. Chronic pain at about a level five. Wow. Yeah, I'm still walking. And there's uh, other procedures I can have done to address that that are also interventional in nature. But if I had had some information from the get-go about PAD, and I'm a medical person, you'd think I'd know. I It would have saved me four years and possibly some of the stints that I'm looking still to have placed. It, it, that goes with, uh, I think Regina has a question we'll get to. I think that goes with the smoking and the eating right and the walking, walk, 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 build those collaterals. If, if we didn't know all these things, if my doctor had told me in the beginning some of these things, or if I had been able to ask these questions, would it, how many of us in the room are dealing with PAD, would it have truly have made a difference in the procedures we've been through and all of that. Yes. I mean, and that's think a big... about the financial saving, the, the money that would be saved medically by prevention, by being proactive. That's the thing is that we wait till it's too late and then, and then we're told have an amputation. Well, you know, it's the same thing with so many other medical issues. We wait till it's too late. We need to address things proactively so if i have a procedure we do a procedure twice a year i promise you that's going to be cheaper than having an amputation and what that cost goes through over a period of time absolutely and regina you have a question 
Yeah, well, basically, I just wanted to throw this thought in there. I've been trying to figure out, like, the doctors have been trying to figure out what was wrong with me for almost four years now. And finally, I had a doctor that just said, because I complained all the time of my legs hurting. And I would tell them, they're not working right. Something's not working. And they would tell me it was fibromyalgia and this or that and give me different medicines and you need an antidepressant. And, you know, I didn't need that stuff. I needed somebody to figure out what was wrong with me or listen to me. And I think because I was 45, they're thinking they're, they're not even thinking of this type of diagnosis. And then finally one doctor said, well, let's just do an ultrasound of your legs and then lo and behold, it came back abnormal. So luckily I was able to get with Kim and she helped me find a doctor that was able to, you know, check on some things and do some tests and stuff. But I don't, I think there needs to be more uh, attention, even younger people that when they go into the doctor and say, hey, I have these symptoms at least it should be on their radar or considered. I mean, I just don't know how to get people to listen, get these doctors to listen or whatever. And that's Um, one thing that we're looking at maybe doing um, something. We have this DEI committee that we, we meet every week, every other week, and we're trying to get some, figure out some brochures and and an approach. We ended up with a grant And maybe one of the ideas being tossed around is to get um, a large contingency of members of our group who want to put out um, these these brochures and bring them to their primary care. And as part of that, you know, for every person that brings it to their primary care, um, you know, get a picture with that primary care person with their brochures and we'll highlight those doctors you know, for being on the front lines and taking a moment to understand PAD. And so that that is one of the ideas to that we're we're tossing around. And so if you want to join us in brainstorming some opportunities that we can do as patients, I'm happy to have you join. I have, hey, I love it. Yeah. How many of us feel like a car sometimes? Here's the thought. I'm driving my car, but it acts up. Every time I bring it to the mechanic, it seems to run right, don't it? Or he, he'll change this part, he'll change that part, he'll change that part because he doesn't really know or he's just guessing half the time. How many of us went through that in the beginning, you know? And we talk about pain, so I tell the, the mechanic, this is what happened, and he says, I, it, it can't be that way, sorry. Well, I drive a car every day, or I know how I feel every day. So I know how you feel with the five living with the graft and in my in my living with my graft. I know how that feels every day. But how hard is it to describe to somebody how that feels when they don't understand it, or they they don't feel the same thing? How hard is it for us to describe pain sometimes? About that's as a hard really good as question. A dementia caregiver describing what it's like to care for their loved one 24 7. My post and the somebody other. pops in once a month and says, Oh, there's nothing wrong here. Everything's fine. It's like, Hey, you don't live this 24 7. So, again, it's back to telling our stories, being passionate about it, but not wallowing in pity about it either. We, yeah. we, we have strength. We have answers we have solutions and one thought i have i love this is it dei you said kim yeah the Um, diversity equity inclusion committee cool i'd like um some info on that uh i'm on the board of directors for elder options in my area and elder options is not just for our elders i'll tell you that right now um i would love to uh, see some interaction with some with your local uh, agency on aging is really what elder options is which comes from a federal grant that's broken down by state by state and then every state is divided up into public service areas 
my area is PSA three, and we cover 16 counties at the largest wow. area, and including the villages in Florida, which that's a whole area by itself. And so I see ways to get this information out there, not just by telling our stories, but reaching out to your local agency on aging and saying, hey, this is a, a big deal. It impacts so many things and it's, it can be so subtle. Let's get some word out before it's too late, before people are looking for amputation and then Meals on Wheels gets involved, home health care is involved. Um, driving people back and forth to the doctor gets involved. All of these things cost money. And if we can beat it before it gets to that point, we're going to save a lot of money and we're going to save a lot of lives. And that's, I agree. I, I, you, you nailed that part there where it going to take, I, I was in, I'm still a member of my Alzheimer's group. And somebody addressed that the other day with me about, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And I said, where'd you get that from? They said, well, that's what the book says to do. And it's like at three o'clock in the morning, the very first time I had to clean my mom up, I said, the book does not describe that that way. <laughs> it's like, until you've been there, you don't. And I, I know that sounds ugly, but until you've been there, you don't know what that's like. It's true. And that's what makes it so hard. But Marsha, I can actually get you some brochures if you want to hand them out. We're even personalizing them for each person that wants to hand them out. You're welcome. We can put a picture of you or your area on the front and actually have a little a letter from you telling right. a little bit of your story and the importance of it. Um, I can share some of that you know, with you and some examples as well so you can see what others have done. Um, I'm still waiting on, we need to do one for Douglas. We did one for Charles. We did one for Robert Castleberry in the group um, who has Pad Life Outdoors on YouTube if anyone's listening and wants to subscribe to a cool channel. Um, and the thing about the DEI, explain the DEI. The DEI is is that exact, it, 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 it really is comes down to us, like you were saying, making, we have to become engaged. We have to become involved all right. the way through the picture not just not just when it's convenient for us but we have to we have to become and stay engaged in it's an inside doctor. out job it really is it starts with the patient the patient has to be educated first and then it trickles out that's how all of this works in this day and age when everything's so top heavy and doctors are so busy and uh, paying off student debts of enormous amounts. It starts inside out. And that's why I love this approach of here's my story. I'll take it to my primary. I'll share it with, with elder options. Yeah. I'll share it online in support groups. And this is how ripples start. Yeah. And ripples make can turn into tsunamis. All right. And we heard that. We've heard that so many times from doctors. We've done these great meetings. And afterwards, we've heard doctors. I've heard a couple really high up doctors go, you know, I never thought about it. I, I never thought about it that way. Right. I, ne I never I never until you said that. I never thought about it that way. Patients are becoming the educators of their doctors. And I learned this firsthand over a decade of dementia caregiving. And now my passion has trickled out into this PAD thing from my own personal experience with it. And it's interesting as an x-ray tech, I'm sure that prior to uh, learning from us that there might be a different practice that would be an option for you. You were referred to only a vascular surgeon, but being an x-ray tech and learning that an interventional radiologist might be an option for you, I bet that was uh, pretty eye-opening. It was very, it was one of the reasons I fell in love with radiology in the first place, because this interventional technology is amazing. It's sort of like, do you remember that old movie, The Fantastic Voyage, where a, a crew of scientists were miniaturized inside this little submarine and injected into the human body? 
that's what interventional radiology is like. And it is, it's in so many areas now, and it's really non-invasive, right, relatively speaking, as opposed to getting cut open. And they do these amazing <laughs> things now. They can clean out plaque inside tiny little blood vessels. They can access blood vessels from your ankles now there's little tiny tiny blood vessels it's amazing what interventional radiology can do they're doing pain relief interventional radiology now it's we right you were doctor. mentioning that uh you learned about drg if you wanted to explain it i saw you mentioned it as yes. well um, actually you DR learned about it through our show yes i did it's a great group um DRG stands for dorsal root ganglion stimulation therapy. That is a mouthful, even for a doctor. So, of course, they shorten it down to DRG. And I don't know if you all have ever heard of a procedure called a spinal cord stimulator, where they put leads in your spine. And then um, it's sort of like a TENS unit. They pulse these little things that interrupt the pain cycle in your nerves. And um, that that was okay for a lot of people, but some people had problems with the leads falling off into the side, into the facets of your spine and getting caught, and it was uncomfortable. And then controlling it got to be an issue because they'd turn it up, say, for their foot, but then it bothered their hip. It was too powerful in their hip. And so by addressing the ganglions in the roots of your uh, nerves, which are located down near your uh, spine, uh, your your sacrum, down in your lower back. Um, they they put these little tiny leads in the ganglions, the the nerve roots there, and those nerve roots are specific to very um, specifically located areas like your toe, your ankle, your foot, your knee, and they've had tremendous success eliminating pain for people that like can resume their lives again. I've, I've had my life put on hold by going to doctors about eight times a month and it interrupts with my teaching Tai Chi and Qigong because it's hard to walk and I have a gimp in my walk and I walk around with toe pain, like five out of 10 pain on most days. And so I am a candidate for this procedure, but getting back to insurance, my doctor and I discussed it and determined that we're going to do some leg work on this first. And he diagnosed me with something called, um, what is it? Critical regional pain syndrome. I think it's called CRPS, which is a weird thing. And it, it kind of is vascular. It has vascular symptoms, it numbness, tingling, um, Nails will grow weird, fatigue, different things like that. Well, that could describe a, bo a boatload of other diagnoses. So to differentiate from my PAD diagnosis, I'm being sent to have a nerve conduction test on my right mm -hmm. foot and toe, which will surely show the nerve damage. And with my uh, two-year history of this horrible neuropathy and all these stent placements, <clears throat> That paves the way for the insurance to say, yes, this is med medically necessary and we're going to pay for it. So those are some little tricks you can do when you go to the doctor to discuss these things. Do your research first. It's, it's important. Again, I go back. The patient is number one and you got to be your own advocate. Well, it's amazing. We had a doctor on here one time. They, they uh, Inventing stuff is they creating a pill that you can swallow that is a um is is a uh is a c you know actually swallow it and instead of doing all these other tests it goes through the intestines and it gives them a picture of where it goes and what it looks like and it's in a pill it's a little pill it's like like movie that movie so there's a little guy in this little pill going through your intestines taking pictures for them it was amazing, the technology, isn't it? Well, I like the one that takes that technology to a whole new level, and they were actually testing it out with Game Boy controllers and actually being able to remotely move the the little robot, the little pill, 
robotic pill uh, around the intestines <laughs> and drive it where it wants to go with simply a game controller, which I don't know, it's disconcerting, but it's also pretty cool, right? <laughs> I think it's, and, and Donix, I can't remember the name of that company that's taking that to the next level, but it's amazing what people are doing in a minimally invasive way. And, you know, anything we have to do to prevent these major procedures, especially who wants to have a colonoscopy? I mean, seriously, I don't know anyone that would, that literally looks forward to that. I would rather be able to swallow a pill and be able to have that give the doctor's clear enough pictures and enough pictures to be able to make a clear diagnosis. Oh, I just wake up every day wanting to have one. <laughs> what the heck, you know? I, know. <laughs> I don't think so. I think that was more of a rhetorical question. My second rhetorical question of the day. Well, the only issue with swallowing a pill instead of an actual colonoscopy is that if they do find adenomas or cancerous spots they're still going to have to go in and do a colonoscopy anyway so my thought is why be redundant about it I mean I do yeah. have a history of colon cancer in my family so I'm not even a candidate for that but that's another thought if you're not at risk at all and you're young and healthy go for it but as we get older um you know I talking about the car analogy Doug um I turned 65 last year and I swear my warranty ran out and it seems like ever since then I've been having doctor appointments at least once a month. Marcia, I'm thankful that I have these options and am able to navigate this nightmare of a medical system we have. Go ahead, Marcia. Oh, I was just going to reply. Um, I, I understand what you're saying about uh, not taking the pill. But on the other hand, people who, you know, because of the anesthesia involved and um, if it truly is preventative, like a younger person getting their first one, um, it might behoove them to to, you know, take a pill without having the associated risks. It probably Absolutely. would depend on the patient. Yeah, they actually have these, uh, I forget what they're called, but they mail them to your house and you do a little test yourself. It's kind of gross that you take a piece of your poop and slap it on this <laughs> slide and then send it off to the lab and they can tell within 90 something percent accuracy if you have cancer or not. That's oh, great man. for someone that, do that is, doesn't have a family history of colon cancer. If you do have a family history of colon cancer, they're, they're not going to do that test for you. They're going to suggest that you go have colonoscopies at least five times uh, every five years. Yeah. Right. You know, so this with, conversation with all, always goes south, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> with, all, with all those thoughts, though, Kim, <laughs> it's like all the tests that are coming up now that we have out yeah, there Kologar. now. You know, with, with like she was saying, how many doctors do you experience don't know how to go through the ankle or don't know how to go through the bottom of the foot? We had that one patient. I remember they were going to do an amputation, but the doctor that you got him to went through the bottom of the foot and was able to clear him out. And it was like, is, is, that, is that from one extreme to the other in all the stuff that we're learning? And that's why we always say, and I think that Marsha Burr will also concur with this, and I think this is what she was alluded to as well, different doctors, different approaches, different tools, different techniques, different philosophies. It's really important that the patient be informed and get multiple opinions to understand all of the available options so that you or, or they can make the most informed decision that's best for them. A doctor may offer you know, someone, ampu you know, two people amputation. And one patient may say, you know what? I really like and trust this doctor. I don't want another opinion. This is right for me. It's best for me. I don't want a revolving door of treatments. I can go to the dentist twice a year and get plaque cleaned off my teeth, but it's too much for me to go in twice a year 
or three times a year to go get plaque cleaned out of my arteries. I want this done and over with. And I, I want the amputation. Great, fine. That's best for them. But that's better than the doctor saying this is the only option that's available for you and everyone else. Because another patient may come in, like, for example, uh, Marsha, who says, I don't mind being a bionic woman. I don't care if I have a full metal jacket by the time we're done and I die fully metal and they can't cremate me and there's still going to be little metal pieces left over. Like, I don't care. As long as I have my feet, let's do everything possible to save my feet. If I'm on deck for amputation, why not try and why not try again and again if I'm maintaining my my ability to walk? Can I can I share a personal? This is, this may be the wrong place to share this, but there are there have been days since I had this axial bifemoral bypass that I thought, you know what? I hate to say this this way, but it's the only way to say it. There have been days I thought I'd rather have lost my leg than deal with what I've been dealing with with the axial, if that makes any sense. There are times that I have thought about that, and it's like, would I have been better off if he had just done that and not put this thing in me and have to live with this thing like apparently I'm going to have to the rest of my life? Well, Douglas, only you can answer that question, right? But that that's that's just that's part of the thinking, I guess, sometimes it, that we all go through. In, well, I in, think that's normal. I mean, you've gone through an awfully lot and having it jabbing you. I, I would think it would be unusual if you didn't question it. Yep. I think that, I think so that it's important for people to understand the difference between vascular surgeons and interventional specialists. Yes. A vascular surgeon, the word surgeon is in there that you can uh, attach that to the term sawbones or cutting they cut. open. It's very <laughs> extreme. It's not an easy thing to be cut open. And if, if some of this stuff can be prevented by interventional radiology procedures, like stent placements, then why not do it? Marcia, it's so much simpler. Marcia, my, um, I feel the same way you do. And my interventional cardiologist kind of felt like it was time for me to consider um, a bypass and sent me to a, a vascular surgeon. To my absolute shock, and I think Kim's too, I walked in and he said, you do not need a bypass. You know, and that, that's what he does. Wow. I, I thought, why are you going to send me to a surgeon if I if you don't think I need surgery? And he turned me away. I w it was the best day, wasn't it, Aren't Kim? you glad? It was amazing. Wow. Well, you know, oh. it, it's interesting because um, what a doctor doesn't, and I want to get to explaining and understanding vascular surgeon, you know, versus the different practices in, in a moment. So remind me to get back to that because it's a very important point. But in, in Mar what I wish that all vascular specialists would do before any procedure. And I think a lot of them do some of it, but I don't think that they explain it in a way that patients understand is that any procedure is literally not the end all be all. You start the revolving door of treatments. It's not going to stop because it's not a matter of if this uh, potential uh, procedure is going to fail. It's just a matter of when. Um, they're not 100% durable yet in, in any form or fashion, whether it's minimally invasive or whether it's surgical, not invasive. The only cut and dried is really that amputation. And even then, what we find with patients is it's still a revolving door because it's one amputation after another, after another, after another, as also Alan, who's on here, found out, and Sunshine, who was on here, also found out that it just doesn't stop at at one, it always seems to go further and further. And it's a fight every day. Um, and so what they need to mention is we are going to do this procedure. We're going to dilate a balloon, inflate a balloon, push a little bit of that plaque aside. We might remove 
some of that plaque using what's called an atherectomy device, maybe if it's indicated for that particular case. And then we may or may not uh, place a stent, what they call a scaffolding, to hold that plaque that they pushed aside open. Less is more. The philosophy is today to leave nothing behind if possible, because those stents can cause further trauma in the body and trigger a healing response. Anything that happens to your vessel triggers a healing response. And it's just a matter of how much of a healing response it's going to trigger and how long it's going to take for that healing response where it's filling up with all the scar tissue to completely reocclude or reblock that entire artery and cause symptoms again. So the key with these procedures is, hey, doctor, give me just that much more blood flow, just that much more blood flow to number one, if you have a wound, enough blood flow to heal that wound. And then number two, to relieve that those symptoms, the claudication, the standard claudication, the pain, the weakness, all of that with which a little extra blood flow could help suppress, right? Get me to a point so that I can walk, 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 get back on my feet, start walking and growing that network of collateral vessels. Those, those vessels that lay dormant in our body that are so small that you don't even see them light up in an x-ray. And I know Marsha Burr can actually talk more about this as an x-ray tech, but they lay dormant, right? Until your body needs them to reroute blood flow around any sort of significant narrowing or blockages in your arteries. And walking ends up saying, hey, body, wake those vessels up. We can't get blood flow, enough blood flow down to the foot as they're walking. So we need to reroute blood flow. And so that's really the potential for these procedures is so if they do block up at some point or when they do block up, you've built enough of these collateral vessels that have rerouted blood flow around that area so that you may not need another procedure. And that's what happened in Marsha's case where the vascular surgeon said, you know what, actually, since your last appointment, you've built some really nice collateral vessels around that block stent. And so you don't need a procedure. Just keep walking. Your body is doing the right thing. It's responding. It's rerouting blood flow. It's creating its own natural bypass, which is really good. And before I send it back to you guys, number two is you, you mentioned the vascular surgeons. So there are four different types of practices that do treat PAD. You do have vascular surgeons, you have interventional cardiologists, interventional radiologists, and you have vascular medicine. Vascular medicine is a, a newer practice in which they really focus on conservative therapy, medicines, and lifestyle modifications. And I think it's really important as they become more widespread across the U.S. that every patient has a vascular medicine doctor. That may be a certification that your vascular surgeon or your interventional cardiologist or your interventional radiologist may also have, but it's worth checking into. Interventional radiologists are the ones that first started doing, it was actually out of Oregon, that it was an interventional radiologist that performed the first minimally invasive procedure to open up a blockage in the thigh. When a patient told her vascular surgeon, I don't want an amputation, not going to happen. And that vascular surgeon went to the interventional radiologists who actually are trained in going into the arteries with wires and trying to open up other areas in the body, other vessels in the body and such. Um, you know, and said, hey, you work with catheters and wires all the time. Do you think you could try something here? And what that doctor interventional radiologist was able to do is take a wire into that that um, blocked artery and the wire was able to traverse the blockage, get through it. And that doctor was able to take um, a small catheter, then a larger catheter, then a larger catheter and a larger catheter that just slowly eked that plaque aside and opened up that vessel, which was great. And that really started the process 
of doctors being able to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we can do this. And then with the invention of the balloon, um, they were able to say, hey, we can do it both in the heart and the legs as well. So interventional cardiologists who were doing the heart were saying, hey, wait a minute, we are able to navigate the twists and turns of the smallest vessels in the heart using these wires and balloons. Why can't we do a straight shot in the legs? So they started getting involved with the legs. And vascular surgeons said, hey, these were our patients originally. We were the ones that started doing the amputations and then the bypasses and what are called endarcterectomies, where they would um, open up with a small incision and scrape out the plaque manually. Um, we we want to be able to treat the whole PAD patient. So they started learning the interventional procedures as well. And so not everyone in every practice performs these endovascular procedures on the legs, but it's really worth exploring all of your options and having a few in your back pocket so that you can go to each one and use our questions on our website at padhelp.org and look at our find a doctor tab and look and see the different criteria that you can actually go to the interventional radiologist, the interventional cardiologist and the vascular surgeon to say, hey, do you do this? Do you do that? And then you can go back and say, you know what, based on my presentation of disease, based on my understanding from all of these doctors, this is the direction I choose to go right now. But it is, it could be only a matter of time where you might need that vascular surgeon only, right, in the future. So, or you might need that interventional cardiologist who can do both the legs and the heart, but it's really up to you as a patient. But don't close off and just focus on practice, focus on the skill set that is right for your presentation of disease. It, unfortunately, <laughs> isn't that what the New York Post kind of screwed us on? Is taking those the minimal invasive procedures and they want to just take that away because they said it was too many. So this is a whole other pop can of worms. So <laughs> well, okay, um, uh, it, it, that's so, what it and it's the New York Times. You said that it is the yeah the New York Times. So okay. There, there is a big debate that's happening, um, you know, across the country and it's leading to, and I think Dr. John Phillips referenced this early on in our, in our after show where he was saying that, um, there are very long delays. He has to, he's facing insurance denials on patients that he believes truly does, it truly do need an intervention or, um, a, a minimally invasive procedure where they take those wires and balloons into the artery, which I'm going to refer here on out as an endovascular procedure, um, you know, in, in this discussion. Um, and because of this New York Times article that came out that seemed to um, mix two different types of PAD into one. And I had talked... It, it, Gosh, this is a hard one to talk. Kind of mix them up. There's PAD, which is early stage, and then it advances to CLI, critical limb threatening ischemia. Where the New York Times reporter was really coming from was this, this um, research that was done by Caitlin Hicks, a vascular surgeon at Johns Hopkins, where she found in her research that there seemed to be a lot of these minimally invasive procedures that are done. In fact, she claims there were too many of these procedures being done um, in these office-based clinics versus in the hospitals. And she believed that those were leading to a high number of amputations. And that followed with um, more articles, uh, you know, as well with the ProPublica, which is another, a 501c3 that does some investigative reporting. They ended up finding um, there were not only a couple of hospital doctors, but also she was claiming that there were some um, office-based labs that were performing too many of these procedures. And in fact, Medicare was cracking down on some of these offices that might have been using too many of the atherectomy devices, those roto-rooting devices, the plaque removal devices. 
And Dr. John Phillips even said earlier that there were a, there are a handful of these these doctors that are in fact doing that. Is that the major problem? He was saying he doesn't believe that that's the case, and there is a large contingency of doctors that don't believe that's the case. But when it, this New York Times reporter was taking that to a whole other level and saying, "Well, this doctor out of Michigan." which is treating these advanced stage patients, the CLI patients, the ones that have critical limb threatening ischemia, that this doctor in Michigan was doing too many patients, too many procedures to save those patients from amputation. And that the state of Michigan had launched an investigation into those procedures. Ultimately, this doctor was not found to have performed too many unnecessary procedures. What they found was this doctor had just lack of documentation, which is a completely different story. But yet, because of that article, insurance companies started pulling um, coverage from this doctor and the area hospitals started pulling um, this doctor's hospital privileges. And ultimately, they sadly um, went out of business because of that. But it was really, I think, a misunderstanding and even talking to the researcher that originally started this whole um, controversy, even that doctor said, I did not intend for my research to be used to support attacking a doctor doing CLI. It was only for those doctors that are performing too many of these procedures in early stage patients early stage PAD patients, what we call intermittent claudicants, the ones that can walk, get a little cramping, but that cramping goes away at rest. Conservative therapy by society standards, they dictate that you know you need to try medication and you need to try lifestyle modifications first, including a walking program. And there are doctors that we know of that are offering procedures for these patients at that stage, which as I mentioned, if you recall, anytime you have a procedure, it does start the revolving door that then you're going to need another procedure and you're going to need another procedure, right? Yeah. I don't know if I've made sense. Yes. Complete sense. Um, I'll tell you something. Um, <clears throat> when I go in and talk to doctors, I always let them know that, you know, I worked in the ER at a medical teaching hospital, and it does change the conversation a lot. So again, knowledge is power. Not everybody is a medical person, but there's no reason why people can't look things up and get educated. Um, so I, I said, well, you told me that my choices are above knee amputation or live with the pain. And this is after I had talked to you, Kim, and learned about Dr. Arthur Lee. I said, have you ever heard of a, a doctor named Dr. Arthur Lee? And this is my vascular surgeon now. He kind of gets this smile on his face, subtle. And he says, well, he's done a lot of procedures. And so you hear that from a vascular guy. And my first thought was, oh, this doctor just plunges through the procedures, procedure, procedure. And I, you know, honestly, I went to see him at that point, Doug, because I was thinking, God, even amputation, I can't live with this pain anymore. And um, I had an open wound on my great right toe. And um, since then, it's healed, fortunately, because of Dr. Lee. But the thing is, PAD, there's four. Oh, I love your puppy all. PA, there's four stages to PAD. There's PAD and people never show symptoms at all. They go their whole life and never even know they have blockages. Good for them. Then you have claudication, which is pain after you walk to the mailbox and back. After that, you hit uh, the critical ischemia, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the final stage, of course, is acute ischemia, where you're talking, uh, look, emergent amputation here. The patient's going to die from sepsis. And 
it's it's important to know these various stages. If you catch it earlier, you have more options. But here's the deal with PAD. It's progressive. It, it's a lot of it is progressive, whether you get it, you know, from the route from diabetes or like me, I have really hyperlipidemia and cholesterol, high cholesterol and the calcium wants to go to my my blood instead of my bones. Fortunately, I'm not osteoporotic, but all of these things are intertwined. And it's really important to understand this if you first even wonder if you have PAD because you go, well, God, what do I do with these symptoms? Well, your answer is simple. Go to the directory and find a doctor about PAD. Do you save your piggies? Do you, does it hurt when you walk to the mailbox? It's a simple question. Do you have leg pain after walking a distance? Do your legs cramp up? Do you have to stop in the middle of something because your legs hurt? Pay attention. I blew it off for a long time thinking, oh, I'm just getting older, uh, you know, and, until walking literally to my mailbox, I had to stop. And my driveway is not that long. So please pay attention, people. I'm just going to scare the doctor. I'm just going to scare him. I'm going to look at him and go, you don't want me to get Kim on the phone, do you? <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> great. I've, I've had, I've, I was thinking when she, Kim was talking, it was like, I remember a couple of times hanging up with Kim and the doctor looking at me and go, who was that? And it was like, that's my patient. Art, she helped me remember everything. And he goes, well, damn. He was like, so well, now I'm I'm just going to scare them and go, don't make me get Kim on the phone. <laughs> Speaking of procedures, again, I found this out from Kim. Um, Dr. Arthur Lee, he's a busy man and he is all about the procedures and he does use the teamwork approach for having his PAs and other doctors, other nurse practitioners and teams take care of kind of the paperwork end of things. So he can concentrate on this rather new technology. And Kim, you were just telling me about a procedure, a DVA, which is really in stage for people yeah. looking at like 100% amputation or doing this deep, arter uh, deep vein arterialization where they can actually take veins and turn them into arteries and then let the, the blood flow heal, kind of heal up the area that is necrotic and has turned black heal it up enough and then amputate um so there's all sorts of things happening these days even you know people say too many procedures and i'm like well look this is a, a progressive thing and if someone's looking at amputation and can be saved by doing a dva and then having a minimal amputation like yeah. just have your toes cut off instead of your whole leg then why not do it? Yeah, and I, mean, I think that that's what I was... Amputation, you're living with lifelong, probably chronic neuropathy, um, having de device malfunctions, getting it fitted right, the healing time, the callousing of, of the nub that's left. It's not a fun thing to look forward to at all, even though at one point at, when I saw this vascular surgeon out of a research hospital of all places telling me, oh, my choices are only amputation or live with the pain? Come on, get real. We had one of the ladies on the show earlier waited a year for her first one, and she she kind of laughed it off, but when it came in, she, the very first day she was putting it on, she was doing a rubber band, and the very first day it broke. Yeah, on the prosthetic. And she goes, well, that's, isn't that not how life goes today? And I feel like I wanted to clarify because again, the too many procedures and I think I was, you know, tr having trouble finding the caboose to my train of thought earlier, but too many procedures, the, the real issue that, for example, Caitlin Hicks was really addressing is she thinks there's too many procedures for early stage or what we call intermittent claudicants. And the real issue that is more widespread right now leading to the most amputations are, you know, too many 
amputations, too many procedures for amputation. But in the New York Times article, they were saying there were too many procedures, such as what Caitlin Hicks was talking about for the early stage, too many procedures for advanced stage doctors. That was what was written in the New York Times article where they didn't differentiate between early stage and late stage. And so she went and ran with this story using that research that was meant for early stage and applying it to late stage and saying that these doctors are doing too many procedures um, in the late stage where this is what I, I said in, in one of my presentations um, the other day um, to doctors about this is for the late stage, I agree that in the early stage, although I haven't seen all of these patients that are supposedly getting offered a procedure in early stage, I in a, in a poll we did of hundreds of people, um, only one person came forward and said they were offered a procedure in this early stage. Most of our patients that come to us and are in our groups actually say that there are too few procedures um, in late stage, in, in the debilitating pain stage, right? And what I, I said to these doctors, I, I liken literally telling these patients in late stage that there are too many procedures to save a limb and that shouldn't be the case is would you tell a cancer patient, well, you could do radiation, you could do chemo, it may make you live longer, it may not, but the only guarantee is that the end result will be the same and you're going to die. So why waste our time? But I've asked this question a hundred times. So if I can postpone amputation, I know, I know, I, I know my PAD is progressive. I know that. It, it's just there's no magic cure here. There's no pill I can take, and it just goes away. But if I can postpone an amputation for six years by having a small procedure done every year, I'd rather do that. Then and Anna brings up a good point. She's on um, watching on YouTube right now. She said it's like the difference between frontal lobotomy versus pinpoint laser surgery. We're still learning. I think Marsha would would uh, appreciate that one. I know some people that need a lobotomy. <laughs> That's a whole other show. Yep. Yeah, we won't get into that one. But the so yeah, I mean, and and that's part of that insanity that we live with today, in that between the doctors and us, and insurance, and yeah. money. And living life, and 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 welcome to the journey. Yeah, I just, I, I just think that we need to all have a meeting of the minds, and that's why I was really excited to be invited to be a part of the conversation last week with Viva, which is, um, a, you know, they they put on a conference and many conferences actually each year, um, one big one. Um, but this one was a select group of vascular leaders. They called it the Vascular Leaders Forum. And we were really talking about how can we all come together, all practices, everyone that has an interest in PAD, every stakeholder that has an interest in PAD from the federal government clear down to the patient and patient advocates, you know, like we are. And let's bring everybody together and say, you know what, our mission is the same. We want to save life and limb. We want to help improve the quality of life for patients around the world. We want to do this. It's important. So we might have different philosophies, different treatment options, different skills. Let's own that. Let's own who we are and come together and put our egos aside and, and let's collaborate versus, you know, this, this continuous crack uh, you know, of condemnation of other doctors, like Marsha was mentioning, um, to their faces of patients and, and competition. It, it's just, it's all at the expense of patients and all of you are suffering because of it. Um, with doctors going out of business, um, there are, you know, in an exploding rate, we had Nancy that mentioned in one of the posts, you know, with the exploding rate of 
of PAD because of the diabetes epidemic that's out of control, we need as many doctors as possible. We can't just have hospitals that are tapped out. We've got to have these office-based clinics. The more, the merrier. The more that we can get on the front lines of getting these patients in early, the better. But we we can't do that if we're not cooperating, if we're not collaborating, if we're constantly, if we're competing and we're driving other doctors out of business and we're tying the hands of, of doctors, both in the office-based labs and hospitals, such as Dr. John Phillips, who is saying that because of insurance denials, he can't even treat the advanced stage patients that are being woken up every night by rest pain and having to dangle their legs over the side of the bed or get up and pace in order to get some sort of relief to get them through the night. But in that way, the insurance companies too? It is the insurance companies. They're the ones that are denying it. I don't want, I don't want a gynecologist telling me I can't have a procedure on my toe. Okay. You're bringing up a hole. You got some cans popping up here. Another can of worms. Um, You bring up another good point, which is that there are insurance companies have go to doctors to review cases. So when they're looking to review and and, and working on pre-approval for a procedure, for example, um, they have doctors on hand that will review it. But there have been cases that we've dealt with where we've even seen a pediatric doctor not even a pediatric vascular specialist, just a general pediatrician who was denying procedures for patients in Texas, which is very sad, and it should not be the case. I'd like to add something at this point that might be helpful to uh, being your own patient advocate. With insurance, a lot of them deny the first time, and... um, if you if you get denied, be proactive about it, pursue it, and demand to know the names of every person that contributed to the report of this denial. You'll be surprised how many times they turn around and approve it right away because there's even been cases where non-doctors, maybe PAs, maybe some medical background have denied cases and they don't even know what the heck they're talking about. So again, you got to be your own voice on this stuff. I think Dr. Phillips, Dr. Phillips that mentioned that one time, he actually called the insurance company and spoke to the person. And, and after afterwards about officially talking to him, they did approve it, but he said, I had to call and say, wait a minute. What are y'all doing? Yep. And there was even, I think Cigna, was it, that is being uh, investigated here in California because it's using um, bots or an algorithm or AI or something to automatically um, approve, it was an algorithm. disprove. Yeah, to approve or disprove. And the doctors who were supervising it um, just trusted what it said and didn't bother to review any of the cases. And so um, they found that a lot of the um, cases actually should not have been disproved. They actually should have um, gone through and patients were being denied or delayed treatment um, for truly um, conditions that needed timely treatment. That goes with the pain issue, isn't it, about dealing with the pain issue and in the medication and some people have a pain I have a high tolerance pain level also but some people don't and how as a as a doctor how do you recognize between someone who who your pain level is a a six but mine's a two or if I complain about a pain level of eight and that that would kill you <laughs> because I have a high pain level. I mean, and as a yeah, recovering you have a high addict, pain tolerance, yeah. 
Yeah, as a recovering addict, I don't like taking medication like that. So it's like, but I do remember my pain level going over 11, and it was like I had to take something, but the doctor said, well, you'll be all right, you know. And it was like, well, all right, I'll just, I guess I have to live. Yeah, I was uh, sent to after my vascular surgeon and I'm, I'm pleading with him because I could only sleep like an hour at a time and have to get up and move and rub my foot. It was at, lying over in bed. I wake up rubbing my foot, crying. The pain was that bad. And I have a high tolerance to pain. I think as we get older and if you've been through a lot of things, you pain becomes relative to your own experience, right? Like my toe pain is nothing as bad as, say gallbladder pain or a horrid toothache but it's up there and it's not it's worse than a, the heart attack i have had you know i have a stent in my heart also and that, that thing's going strong uh, my stent was placed in 2010 and it's still good but um yeah the pain level thing how is a subjective test and so i was sent to this pain specialist and i walk in and the vibe is like oh god we're all a bunch of criminals here and there's a big sign make sure you pee in the cup before you leave and i'm like jesus i went to this guy this place to talk about a drg procedure and the PA doesn't even know what I'm talking about. And the doctor that she refers me to only does spinal cord stimulation. I just please give me like 18 opioids, you know, oxy roxy contents to so I can sleep at night. And it's like an act of Congress. Listen, I don't want to do drugs. You know, I, I drinking is what started all of this problem for me so many years ago and I quit drinking after my heart attack in 2010 and it, it's an embarrassing thing for a lot of people to have to go through that you're already like signaled out oh you're here for drugs it's like no I'm not I I'm here to find out about an interventional procedure that will help keep me off the drugs so that's been part of my experience. That's true. I remember the first time I saw Dr. Walker, I was up for two days because my foot hurt so bad I couldn't sleep. And I thought that was the worst pain I'd ever experienced in my life until my defibrillator went off. And after my defibrillator went off three times, it was not, well, let me change. <laughs> let me change what I think is the worst pain I've ever felt. And and we hear that all the time in the group about people who can't sleep because they hurt so bad and trying to explain to a doctor that they're not there for, for drug seeking. But how do we convince that doctor? I just, give me something to help me sleep at night or for give me, help me, give me something to help sleep for four hours. I just need, and let me ask you about pain. I thought about this the other day. Does the does our pain level and what we go through also depend on our surroundings and what we're going through at that time? So my thought was, is there are days I'm in a great mood and my, my graft is hurting, but it doesn't, it's not my number one focus in my head, if that makes sense. There are other days that my graft is hurting and, and I'm low on money or I'm low on groceries and it just adds to that insanity thinking does that make sense to y'all absolutely um because you know it's not just our physical bodies it's mind body spirit and like it's all connected together and so our mental health is is critical in all of this and you know after doing 10 years of caregiving uh in dementiaville after working seven years in a trauma one er I've kind of learned how to triage life and it's become pretty simple to me. I can choose love or I can choose fear. And so, you know, when I'm feeling these feelings of anxiety, I have to stop and ask myself, where is this coming from? 
is it really my toe hurting that bad or am I obsessing on it because maybe I need to go do something else. Maybe I need to go take a walk. Maybe I need to go breathe. Maybe I need to just smile and reach out to someone. Maybe I need to go on a Facebook group and, and vent. So all of these things are interconnected. And that's that saying, we keep doing the same things and we keep getting what? Same that's behaviors, don't we? the definition of insanity, is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Um, and that's why... In this I'm March, gonna... we have to hold hope. We have to, you know, find, find gratitude in the moment. You know, yeah, my toe hurts right now. Well, guess what? I'm here in this wonderful group learning new things. I have a roof overhead. I have food. My puppy dogs are happy. Life is good in this moment. And sometimes I just have to stop and ask myself like the, from, from a old Terminator movie, um, the two way, the waitress and, you know, that's being pursued by the, the Terminator and the other girl looks at her and says, well, think about it. Who's going to really give a, an F? in a hundred years anyway. I mean, is this really going to matter in a hundred years? What's happening right now? It comes back to like right now, this moment. And we're all curious what Kim is eating. Snacking on. What are you snacking on? Mm. Now that I've dropped, dropped my microphone. Um, I am eating my dad, my lovely, adorable dad, um, made me a little dish of Granny Smith apple and natural peanut butter. Yummy, so I'm yummy. Healthy. I'm eating healthy. <laughs> and that's why we're all grateful for you, Kim, because you're there when we need you, you You've been able to bring us all together, and I, I, I just—I also have to remind everybody. I, I don't—I'm not sure how many people here understand what you go through day after day, twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week, three hundred sixty-five days a year for us, and how grateful we are that actually you have put your life on hold. Sorry about your dating, but. I've told you before, God is preparing that man for you right now, or he's still working on you to get you ready. So just be patient. But you put your life on hold and, and to be to be with us and how mm -hmm. grateful we are. You know, it's so funny because when I started this, I, I always thought that it would be amazing to uh, to find the love of my life, who is a doctor, who is as passionate about limb salvage as I am, that we could literally, you know, collaborate on multiple fronts. We would understand each other. We would understand each, each other's passion. Um, and, and we'd be able to travel the world together. And everywhere we go for, let's say, vacation or whatever we do, um, we could take time to go and help people along the way. Um, you know, and, and find vulnerable communities that uh, that we can make a difference in. I've always lived a life of service. I come from two parents who believed in living a life of service. Um, and so it, it only makes sense that this is the direction that I go, that I found my purpose in life. And, you know, I know that there are some people that are not spiritual, that don't believe in God. But for me, um, my life, my choice, my experience is I believe in God. I have true faith. And for a while, I, I was floundering a little bit. I was more spiritual than anything else, more just general law of attraction. But God actually came to me and said, this is your life's purpose. This is what you need to be doing. You are my person there on earth to help save life and limb. I need you here. And the moment that I acknowledge that, it just opened the gates to so many people that welcomed, you know, what I had to offer. And I've even had two people in our group who came to me and said, 
that God told them, and both of them are pastors, both of them said that God led me to you. God said that there was an angel here on earth that is going to guide you in the right direction to save your leg. And in both situations, we were able to save the leg. And and that means the world to me. Secondarily, the other confirmation of the direction in, in doing this was I went to my brother's church down in San Diego and I was sitting in the back. My brother had given, you know, he was, he was preaching. And so my dad and I had gone just to, to see my brother and um, they have this, I don't know what you call it. Maybe those of you who, who do attend church more regularly, they had like a prayer tunnel or something like that, where you go through and you go through the tunnel and they put their hands on you. And then you get to the end and you, you know, one person picks you aside and says, says an extra prayer for you. And this one woman, Chelsea, pulled me aside and she puts her hands on me and she says, whoa, God really loves you. <laughs> and I laughed. I said, God loves everyone, right? You tell that to everybody. And she says, oh, no, 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 no. Like, you're doing something. What are you doing? God says he loves you. And I was like, come on. And she went into detail that not into the specifics of PAD, but she went into detail that of how I was somehow helping in healthcare and helping him to facilitate getting people care somehow. And I was like, you talk to my brother. I'm looking for every excuse. And she's like, I didn't even know that you were Todd's sister. Like I had no idea. Um, and so it just further affirmed that, you know, I, I really am not only passionate about this myself and love so much and feel so much sense of, of, I don't know the word of not compassion or empathy, but I, I feel like you're, you're my brothers, you're my sisters, you're my family. And I am part of your journey. I want to be part of your journey. I want to be with you every single step of the way. I want to remove your pain. I want to find you the solutions. I want to relieve your fear. I want to relieve your anxiety. I want to alleviate that stress. I want to, you know, get rid of the darkness. I know in reality, I can't really do that for everybody and be the end all be all. But that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I want to do. I want to make that difference. I want to be that light. And, so, you know, so be, be something. What? Be patient. Yeah. One step at a time and just believe that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yep. And it's, it's funny that someone said to me one time, um, I had an executive coach, um, Christine Meyer, who is, who's an amazing executive coach. And, um, she helped me through kind of the first couple of years as I was getting used to the roller coaster, you know, of this, because, you know, when you cry, I cry, when you get upset, I get upset, you know, I don't care if you're right, wrong, or indifferent. I don't care if you're feeling something, I'm feeling it with you. And she said to me, because it was, I was having so many highs and lows all the time that she said, you know, you can't um, be sick enough to make someone well and you can't be sad enough to make someone happy. And I said, well, at least on that, on the latter, I said, at least I can cry with someone and we can just sit in our own little poopy corner together. And sometimes that's what just what we do, don't we, Douglas? And Marsha, I think is on, um, you know, sometimes we we're not just trying to make ourselves feel better. You know, we don't, we, we just cry, right? We just sit so, in our own uh, little poopy corner just because that's where we are. We know we want to feel better, but you know what? We don't have to do that right now. We can so, be right where we he, are he, because he, we're he, together. Prepare, he, he is preparing that doctor or there's a Toyota mechanic out there that he prepared for you. <laughs> So just be patient. You are so funny. It, it's amazing. I had one date where um, I realized that probably it, it wouldn't be behoove me to be in a um, relationship with someone who's not a, who's queasy with blood. Um, because there is actually something where um, 
I don't know if you've ever done it even with your 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 significant other or if you remember back dating, if you were dating with phones. But <laughs> um, he asked me, the gentleman asked me, he said, OK, here's the deal. This is how we really get to know each other. We switch phones and the first five pictures that come up, you have to explain and tell the story. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. I had... Because everyone sends me everything, and I'm not kidding on this. And because um, it one was on on WhatsApp, um, and you can't tell who's who or what's what. All you see, um, because I don't keep any patient information on my phone. It was just like close up pictures. <laughs> Gangrenous toe was one. A leg ulcer was another. The kicker was actually poop that someone had sent me a picture of um, because they were on all these, these these medications and they were wondering if their poop looked normal. And sometimes people, they ask me because they want me to send it to their doctor to ask them, you know, so they send it to me because I'm in real time discussion. <laughs> well, I didn't get a call back from that date again. <laughs> it, I did get a call back. I didn't know what he saw right away. I didn't he's know what driving he home. Yeah, he's, he's driving home thinking, what the together. hell? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that was really, that was really fun. That was a good one. Um, but yeah, I, I you know, it, the other thing, I, you know, I do like you. I like learning. I like growing. You know, my life isn't just talking about pity, but you know what? There's still so much to learn and it is so much of my life right now. I mean, even my dad loves talking about it with me because I think it's just interesting talking about it relates to the whole healthcare system and health is life. You know, we talk about growing collateral vessels. We talk about eating healthy. It's fun to talk about all of that stuff. It's fun to inspire others. We can't go anywhere, you know, with, with me and my dad where my dad's not talking to someone else in his age group about PAD um, and about what we do at the Global PAD Association. And, you know, he he always talks about Stella. He loves Stella. Um, but you're, it's Douglas's dog. Um, there's Stella. There she is. There's that pretty girl. Um, and, and that was because we talked about Stella because we were upset that um, you were kicked out of a, um, a facility. Bucky's over in Texas, which I'm actually upset. And if but anyone from Bucky's sees this, I am still upset that I ended up filing a formal complaint on their website and I did not get a response from Bucky's about your situation and you getting kicked out of Bucky's. And there's no phone number to call to be able nope. to get a hold of anyone at Bucky's to be able to report it so they can do anything they want and get away with it, which is very frustrating. Um, because you actually have a real service dog um, that, that and, and we do too. And that's why I think that we took that personally. And my dad keeps talking about Stella and how could they kick Stella out of a facility? But we talk about this all the time. And I think that it's important right now more than ever for everyone to talk about PAD as much as possible to start spreading awareness. They did a study that... Um, show that more than 70% of people, you know, don't know what PAD is. And that's why people are not getting diagnosed. We need to raise awareness and it's going to take every single one of us. And if it means that, for example, I was on and actually um, the emergency doctor, I don't know if, no, I don't see him now, but he was on just a little bit earlier um, when he asked me what I did and I talked to him about PAD, he was interested in it. And I was able to share more information with him. And we started even a discussion, which led to him wanting to join um, the discussion about PAD right now. And if we can inspire more doctors that we come in contact with to say, hey, join us on a Wednesday, join us on a Saturday, learn more, immerse yourselves with the, the stories and the experiences of people who are living with it on a daily basis. Yeah, join me Wednesday night at six o'clock. We have a discussion, just an open fire chat discussion about 
living life today and about PAD and living with PAD is just an open. We laugh, we talk, we share. Yep, we talk about bacon. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, I'm married to what I do. I love what I do. I love each and every one of you. Um, and you know, whatever I can do to help, you know, I really, I really try to, and Vlad, we're going to continue to keep working. Um, I do want you to get an appointment with your primary care. And I told you, I'm happy to be on the phone with your primary care doctor to have this discussion with you and help to take notes during that discussion so that you can get the answers that you need. Secondarily, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check with biomedics and see if they have one of their primary care physicians that knows a little bit more about PAD who might be in your area. And then you might be able to get a primary care doctor that has more experience with PAD and has their technology. And then you can compare the results between the test you had prior that you're not comfortable with and the results that you may get from using their device as well. Uh -huh. That would be great. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Just remind me on Monday to message. Um, her name is Adara, I-D-A-R-A, -A, and I'll ask her um, because I don't, the padtest.org is not 100% up yet. Um, we're hoping to have that up um, completely next week. We're going to do a formal announcement next week that we're doing this. Um, and so hopefully I'll be able to to find someone in your area. I can so you want, me, you, you want me to message you on Monday? Yeah, message me on Monday, just to give me a little reminder, give me a little nudge to say, hey, message you, Dara, to see if there's someone in my area. Um, you know, Your that, name is Idara? Idara? I-D-A-R-A, -A. her name is Idara. Idara. Uh, I just want to ask what kind of new test uh, machine the the doctor was talking about earlier because I joined a little late. He was talking about some new test device, right? It's it's called Padnet P A D N E T and it's by Biomedics B I O M E D I X dot com. And, and that's the, and that's the test you was talking about can be done in my area. It might be able to be done in your area. I am going to check to see if there is a doctor in your area. I'm on right now and I'm going to see if they have filled this out. I don't think that they've gotten this um, out. No, there's nothing. Um, they haven't um, filled this out yet. So we'll get that populated hopefully sometime next week um, with more of these. So funny, I just looked up California and, and it lands on Avocado, California. That's awesome. Love it. Love my avocados. <laughs> avocado, California. Um, I also, I was going to share with you guys this, and you might have seen it, this before. Um, but this is my favorite. If you guys can share this, you know, on your social media, take off your socks. And I said, hey, doc, not dog. So for you dog lovers, I was even going to think of um, some sort of competition, maybe with people who have well-trained dogs to actually do this. And we would feature different dogs actually doing this. I don't know if Stella would do it. Douglas, I sent you a picture of Shari doing it, didn't I? Well, wait a minute. Oops. Did I stop talking? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear. I'm still on the screen just changed as all the view changed. I'll call you. There's my girl. There we go. So anyway, that was really fun. Just thought you guys would enjoy that. Well, I'm going to jump off. I hope you guys don't mind. It's been really fun to have this conversation. Um, 
I'm not sure if Douglas is going to stick around, but yeah, I, I have I, to. I'm going to get off too. The thunderstorm yep. now getting here, so we're probably uh -oh. going to. You probably be safe. Power. Everyone be safe. And Marsha, if you, I, you just shared your story. If you don't mind, if we post that separately, you know, as well, so you can share it with other people who, um, and we could share it on YouTube well, as well as a separate story. But if you'd like to come back in, let's say in June, and we can schedule a Saturday where we can feature you for the entire show. And especially with you being an x-ray tech, I think that you could also have some really great advice, you know, working in the healthcare field for many people. I would love that. Actually, let me clarify. I'm a retired x-ray tech. I just turned 66 the other day, two days Oh, ago. wow. And um, I became an x-ray tech in the time of the transition, right in the middle of from film to digital. And so oh when goodness. I started at this research hospital where the vascular surgeon works, um, there was still one of those rotating doors for the film so the the dark room would stay dark and I traversed through film where there really was such a thing as a wet reading which means read it right away even though the film's still wet into now digital teleradiology -radi it's just amazing all this technology but I would love to share uh, my story and my growing passion about PAD and um, I'm a big networker I believe in storytelling, and I believe that uh, our passion from our heart is really pay attention to what you love, because that's a little God wink to you telling you, hey, pay attention to this, because you're good at this, and we need we need you. We need you to tell your stories and and do what you do, and, and if you can, everybody can do. And so if with that can, said, I say, keep on walking one step at a time. If you can join us Wednesday night, join me in my fireside chat and, and share with us. Um, yeah, I will try. Right now, I'm a, a doing this uh, Qigong class that Love it. is online. It ends at 6, but I can pop in right after. I'd love that. Yeah, you well, know, anytime. But we'll schedule you for a Saturday, and we'll have you share the, the whole thing, and we'll map out the show. And um, I think that'll be great. Just pick a Saturday and in um in june and we'll definitely yeah, really appreciate I, I'm, you i have my calendar right now i i believe in planning ahead to a point oh that's good um, and we have anna on my there. doctor appointments um none scheduled so far in june um actually you know i do have one in june but not on saturdays so any saturday the 15th in the middle of the month whenever you want to do it maybe even any, any Saturday that month, you I'll let you pick because I'm pretty flexible with my schedule. I'm retired now and I can do what I want, when I ha want, how I want, with whom I want. Hey, I like that freedom. Yeah, freedom. baby. Yeah, you I have love the same it. issues I do when I get up in the morning. What am I going to do today? I get up in the morning and say thank you. What am I grateful for today? And I, I go to my happy place. I smile and I do some uh, Tai Chi and Qigong and it really, listen, exercise, even Qigong and Tai Chi is really good for PAD because you're focusing on circulating your energy and energy yep. is what circulates your blood. Yep, it's true. It's good energy. And that's what they actually say. There's some people that we had a, a woman um, that came on the show, Susan, I think it's uh, SusanPerformance.com. Um, but Susan Davis um, does energy moving and she talked a lot about that in our early days of, you know, working with our organization. She talked to people in the group about um, energy blockages can actually um, present themselves as physical blockages in your body mm -hmm. and, you know, clearing up those emotional issues that in energy blocks in your body through doing tai chi qigong all of those um there is a school of thought that says it it can really help improve your circulation so 
um, different people, different philosophies, right? Oh, I'd like to add something to that. Um, being on the board of directors for Elder Options, I got the opportunity to get certified in teaching Tai Chi for arthritis and fall prevention. And, oh, wow. Um, if people are interested in, in learning these simple movements, uh, you can reach out to me. I'll answer you back. I, I can teach you Zoom. Um, yeah, why don't we do? I, I taught locally. And oh, you actually, have Joshua. Qigong is easier. Uh, what's that? You have Joshua, our producer here, that's salivating. And I can just literally read his mind right now. So why don't we schedule... Um, we should have maybe, uh, you know, an exercise day of the week where we get to experience um, different types of movements. And maybe you would wouldn't mind kicking it off and we'll go, you know, live in the group and live on YouTube and we'll all get to do it together once a week. Oh, I love that. Yeah. You know, okay. that actually um, that might even be incorporated into like at the end of my story, a kickoff into uh, like, let's do Saturdays for exercise, you know, don't sit and watch TV. Let's get up and move. Yeah, we can do it any day. You just um, pick a day and, um, you know, we can, we can go ahead. We can do it. That would be awesome. That'd be cool. Cool. Yeah. I Everyone actually, would love it. I have my living room all set up with my laptop and a different webcam Okay. Um, so that you can see my whole body. Not to put you on the spot, but we'd love to even have something like this regularly. Um, I, I think that it would be wildly popular. I would be, I mean, even if it's, and I know Douglas would do it. I know Marsha would do it. I don't know if Marsha's still on. Yeah, um, I am. But I would be, I would literally yeah. participate every single time. I right. would do it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Douglas would do it. Saturday. Saturday is a great day. Let's let's do Saturdays. I'm I'm on board to doing this every week. Part of why I decided to start teaching Tai Chi and Qigong is because it makes me practice. Listen, ah. I live alone and I can be an underachiever and get non-motivated. And so by teaching and interacting with others and providing a service, it keeps me motivated too. The, the teacher becomes the student. Yeah. So let's let's do Saturdays. I'm all on board for it. I'm not really I'm, ready to do it today right now because I'm sitting nope. here actually in my pajamas still. Is Saturday the <laughs> only day? Do. No. Um, let's see. Wednesdays just, are a good day. Uh, I do some odd jobs on Tuesdays thursdays and fridays but even sunday is you know, good mondays are good no the but thing about these, when, depending on my doctor schedules because i have a lot the thing of about wednesday is we could actually do a short one hour gossip fireside chat and go into that right after that because they kind of go together well i want to do it where we can actually plan an actual separate stream so that it's you know what I mean? Yeah. So that we can schedule it and then people can join from YouTube and in the groups and actually have it scheduled. And I just didn't want to mess with your, your Wednesdays are for that. And I don't want to interfere with your Wednesdays are the chat days. Um, and that's why I was like, I, 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 you know, and then Saturdays we have our show, then we had have an after show. So I was trying to figure out if there's another day that we can. How about um, a Monday? How about Mondays? Yeah, uh, start later on the in week. the afternoon because you know I will have some doctor appointments coming up. I swear I see doctors about six to eight times a month. Right, that now. would be great. Uh, Mondays are op pretty open for me. I love this. I'm loving the collaboration. Me too. I love, it. I love the networking. It builds my passion. Because listen, I'm an introverted extrovert, which means I can talk to a crowd of two thousand people, but actually leave me alone. I'm a hermit. Me to too. Charge my batteries. So I need this interaction to keep my balance. Yep. I'm with you. And we're here for you. We're 